A one, two, one, two, how are you? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining for a late night stream with a very influential name, very insp inspiring name to many of us. I'm excited to bring Bolo, the producer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome in. How you doing, Bolo? I am doing as well as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it, it's an absolute pleasure to finally connect the dots. I know we kind of like exchanged information some months ago and I always yeah. had it in the back of my mind. I was like, man, I got to reach out to him. And in the meanwhile, I kind of just got caught up in your content because just your, your your consistency of putting out content that is so valuable, not just to producers who use hardware, but producers who use software and just really just your contribution to conversations about the uh producer culture in general you cover so many bases but for those that don't know 12 time platinum producer uh, 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 hold on uh, are, are, we, are, we, are we now wait 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 where are we at now we i just found out i'm i'm, I'm now I, officially i'm a now 13 time hey, but you, come on now but, but if you count the records that i didn't get paid for <laughs> i'll probably be around about 17. Yeah, they wasn't ready for that for the, for the truth bomb and all of that. But absolutely, we congratulate you. I'm gonna give you this round of applause right here. Let me go ahead and make sure I acknowledge the good old chat. <laughs> the good old chat in the building, my late nighters, my DIYers. Okay, <laughs> a magnificent Dub C beat designers, A O Sean, Mister Mister Solo Key, A O Sean. Hey, that's my guy, A O Sean. Yo, we got, it's funny, as I was looking at the videos, I was like, man, there's a lot of overlappage, which means <laughs> a lot of times we just serving the same community and they're getting value for whatever specific needs that they have. And it's just a beautiful time to be an online producer and have access to folks like you. And you, man, you, I got to give you your roses because I, I do want the folks to get to know you who have, if this is your first time hearing about Bolo, the producer, First of all, you got to do more. You got to be online more because his brother is everywhere. You can't you cannot get away. Like if, even if you're not on YouTube, if you're on Instagram, I'm sure if you were scrolling through your, your reels, you seen one of these these, uh you know, this rapper does this or, or you know, uh, uh, black folks make a remix to everything like you have been so <laughs> prolific in this and you've gone so enormously viral. But there's so many ways that somebody can be introduced. I got to give you your, your roses for this, though, in that. How much you as someone who, and once again, I'll make an assumption. This is why I wanted to talk to you, who has made your introduction through going through the industry. I believe uh, your bio says since 2007 for you to take the route of I'm not, even, not only going to give information, but I'm going to embrace these young producers who otherwise would probably just be like linear notes. Because, you know, unfortunately, society at large, they're getting better at it. They don't always give the producer the same roses as the artists, right? See, nah. Seeing you have these interviews and give them an opportunity to a lot of times get their first interviews because you can't find any other ones. Uh, you just are doing so much to ensure that their their careers have more longevity. So I got to first of all, give you props. I'm going to keep doing that throughout this stream because you're just someone that you inspire me on a regular basis. So, Bolo, tell these folks where you're from who you are, and uh, maybe even some, one, some of the credits they might have heard of. I was surprised by the one I saw. I was like, what? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, originally, um, born and raised, uh, uh, I'm from Tampa, Florida. Um, and I, originally, I was a athlete there. Like, I was a football guy, basketball track guy. Okay. Um, got, a, got a scholarship to play at some schools for and, football uh, ended up, yeah football i didn't get scholarship for I would, basketball i was decent i was like the guy <laughs> that was like i could jump now one thing i can do i can jump still can jump to this day right going up is no problem coming down is the problem okay yeah, but, um, yeah it's, it's, it's not but, it's not easy on my knee so i get you <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i was the one that maybe you know if we did 10 minute quarters i would probably get two and a half minutes but when i got in i was going to try to get at least a dunk a game so i was that yeah. guy Oh, so you want with the boosties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, track guy did high jump, long jump, triple jump, stuff like that. Ran the 400. I was very athletic. And then when I got to college, you know, 
first college I went to, I kind of got homesick and I went to another college and I was like, okay, you know what? My guy was like, hey, we start a new football program. Let's go to Alabama. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to try it. Right. So I go to Alabama, get there. And then I just kind of lost my love for, you know, football like that because it was just, it just wasn't the same. Mm. And then um, I met one of my good friends at the time. His name was, um, his name was uh, Tyrone. We call him Ty Cutter. And he was the first black person I've ever met from Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was not what I thought was going to be on the end of that sentence. But that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so but, um, he, he just started talking to me one day and I was like, OK, he, he seems real cool because I actually came up there with like 20 of my guys from my hometown. We actually right. went up there. We always going to play football and basketball and all that stuff. But. Um, it, we just went a different route, you know what I'm saying? It was at an HBCU called Steelman College in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the same city where the U University of Alabama is, so it's a big college town. Mm. And um, me and him just got to talking, and he told me he does music. I was like, you do music? He's like, yeah, I make beats, I do all this. So I'm like, okay, whatever. Mm, I don't get into that. Right. And then um, maybe like a couple of days later, man, we was in his was we stayed we both stayed in the same dorm room. I ended up going to his dorm, and then uh, he had a whole setup in there, and he just had a computer, and then he had Cakewalk at the time. Okay, what was do you remember your initial? Did you kind of get like a uh, the movie rush, like you know, like like in those movies where they see what's going to be like a, a hint of their future? Did you feel anything seeing that setup? Nah, not really. I just seen it because we was in there just like just chilling because him and this other guy from Tennessee called Blackface, they had like a rap group. Right. They were starting a rap group. And there was another kid in the city named by the name of Kenny Thomas. He used to go, he used to go back and forth to Atlanta because we was three hours away from Atlanta at the time. Okay. He would go back and forth and sell beats and be around all he he knew all of the, the new inter, entertainers. He used to open up for everybody. And this guy was doing this in this little city at the time. And um the day I went in there, he was making a beat. And um, and then I went in there and I was like, let me just try it real quick. You know how it is. Let me try it. <laughs> I think I can do some little something right Yeah, now. I could do something with this. <laughs> and then next thing I did something, and I was like, yo, that's kind of you know, that's kind of dope. Wow. But um, you know, before that, my brother, he was a rapper in the city that I lived in. And he had beat machines, drum machines, and stuff. I I was never really into it like that. Right. But um when when this happened, it kind of stuck to me. You know what I'm saying? It like it, it stuck to me. So I was like, you know, I, I think I could do this. So went home that summer and my brother had just bought a Roland 303 and he brought a, a eight track Tascam uh, uh, recorder, but it was a tape recorder. Okay. And so we had eight tracks. It was on tapes. We used to get those old TDK tapes. We used to get the uh, the gray ones, the high fidelity ones. Mm -hmm. And I would mess. I messed with that 303 so much that I, I learned it. And then. Um, so completely self-taught at this point. Yeah, I didn't have anybody. I didn't wow. have anything. The only thing that I, that I really needed help with was connecting the 303 to the computer mm -hmm. via MIDI. And that's when you had to have the, you know, the MIDI DIN cables and everything. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I was like, I cannot get any sound out of here. I was like, I got the MIDI cables hooked up, but I don't hear anything. Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm saying? But I didn't, I thought that the sound went through the MIDI cables. Yeah. Until, <laughs> <laughs> so you, yeah. You, you, you sound like me when I was trying to hook the PlayStation up, trying to get these beats off the of MTV Music Generator. Yeah. I was like, I was <laughs> like, so RCA. All right, I'm yeah, gonna, I'm gonna go to fries. I and didn't I'm even, see, <laughs> I, but because the thing it never even registered to me. Like, okay, before that, before we used MIDI, I just hooked the RCA cables up to the stereo that we had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, um, it never thought to me to okay, we still need to do it. <laughs> so, I mean, when, I, you, so when, when you don't have a, and I'm assuming, what year is this we talking about? This was summer of 2000. Summer 2000. Yet, yeah. even what the internet looked like at that point i remember vividly that i was looking for tutorials on the things that i was doing at that time on message boards with no youtube the way that we know it today like that was years after but it's like that you had to literally hope that the guy that's writing this message with no picture knew what he was talking about 
It was it was <laughs> it was nothing. Like it was you had to go to a library and hope that there was a book, or you had to know somebody who worked. Mm -hmm. And it was always the either the nerdy. I'm just be honest. It was the nerdy white guy who played in a band yeah. that 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 knew how to hook up keyboards. Yeah. And I took the thing down there. I, you know, my brother didn't even know he was at work. I took the 303 down there. He showed me everything. I got it running. And I literally spent probably 90% of that summer at home just in there trying to find out why this thing won't hook up wow. to me. But during that time, I learned how to use a program, which we had. It was called Music Center Pro at the time. It was a $30 program. We had okay. a compact computer. We was recording on it. I was learning how to record. And then when I went back to school, I didn't have a computer like that. So um, luckily, um, the school we were at, they um, they supplied us with laptops. Okay. Uh, we were one of the first. We was basic test dummies. So they gave it was and it was backwards too. They gave all of the music product like the people who were doing music and science and everything. They gave us PCs, and they gave all the English majors the Macs. <laughs> Yeah, somebody, somebody in charge didn't know didn't know who to give what. <laughs> yeah, it was it was because you know it, that's when the new that's when the the, the new age Mac laptops yeah. came out and they had horrible issues with them. The screens used to that's why the Mac screens right now are so good because they gave them to all these college students at this time, mm -hmm. and basically every time something happened, they would write up a report, send it over because it's not like how it is now where it has a whole diagnostic tool in it and all that stuff. Right, they would take that throw that over into Apple and then Apple would redefine those computers and who better to test your computers than a whole bunch of college students. Yeah, and yeah. They collected so much data from us because we were using basically the laptops for they were basically Walkmans for a lot of people. You know right. what I'm saying? And then, you know, it was it was it was crazy and I didn't you know I now I see why they did it but mm. yeah you know I came across you know I had a laptop and I actually came across a few laptops mm -hmm. <laughs> during that time <laughs> yeah I got a lot of my, I got a lot of laptops in my graveyard if if I if, if they had names I would definitely have a a bunch of names tatted on me cuz man it's it's I, and I've always been a PC dude like yeah the, my last year of middle school they just got those those uh you know those those infamous uh i forget what which one it was but the ones that the apple joints that came in different colors and it was yes. like with the floppy disk still coming in there and all of that yeah. and the cd and that was the I last year that was in there so when i left from there it was nothing but pc it's been like that since even today but i've had dells i've had like you said compact i've had my asus and a lot of them uh they lasted but I ended up, I, you know, dying at some we, point. <laughs> yeah, we had we had everything because you know I had a I had a PC at the time, and you know I started with you know, Cakewalk and stuff, but then during that time Logic was on PC mm. time, and um, I was recording, but I was still using that same stuff. But I was using my laptop, and I actually found a little cheap computer at some point. But I think the turning point came when um, my girlfriend at the time, my college girlfriend, she uh, she actually transferred from Stillman to the University of Alabama. Okay. And she ended up getting a refund check. And she used that refund check to uh, to buy me a, uh, it was a compact, mm -hmm. at the time, compact computer. She bought me that, and she bought me a, a CD burner. Wow, yeah, and that yeah, man. Transformed everything because not only did I have the computer, mm -hmm. I had the program, and at that time, I could actually burn a CD <laughs> in, record, <laughs> in record time in fifteen minutes for a whole CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, don't so, don't don't get them. Don't get us started about CDRWs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> CDRWs, all that. I I had the. Um, I had the, the mini, they're like the mini imp, the mini disc machines. Yeah. I had that. Man. I, my other homeboys had ADAP machines. So I got started with that, but you know, I was producing and I wasn't producing on hardware yet. I was producing on Reason, right. Reason One. Okay. Okay. That was the first stuff I was producing on. And then I went from there 
Then um, I didn't really produce on Cakewalk. I was on Reason One. Then from there, I went to, uh, I stayed on Reason for a long time. And then from there, I went to uh, Cubase. Okay. And I was on Cubase. And then and then in 2005, that's, well, actually, no, 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 my bad. 2003 is when I got on my first MPC. It was a, it was a uh, 25, it was a 2000 XL. Mm -hmm. And don't know where my homeboy got it from, but <laughs> yeah, I got hold on, that. Hold on, y'all notice the eyes. The eye. <laughs> the, the, I didn't see nothing. I don't know nothing. It's just here, and it's, and and that's it. That's that. I don't, I, I don't know nothing, my friend. I don't know nothing. <laughs> I don't see nothing. I love I it. Know I love it. But um, <laughs> yeah, I got that, and that thing fell apart quick because it was it was. <laughs> I, it, it was it was bad news. I, I think somebody might have refurbed it by now, but uh, I got that. And then you know I just kept producing, and then um, I was putting out I was putting out acts. Um, I was putting out acts online. I mean not online, but on 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 the school campus. We was I had rappers and stuff, and we were selling CDs. We made a lot of money selling CDs. We were doing shows with like Pastor Troy. Right. We got real cool with David Banner. Um, anybody that came into town, they came to us because back then it was if you had a name where you were from, the people kind of found you. And that's what I liked about it right. back then, because if you if you just even did music, people were like, oh, you doing music like, oh, that's you spending money. You got something going on. It's yourself. not like how it is. So cliche it is right now. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I just kept doing that and then um, ended up moving back home in 05. My mother passed. I ended up moving back home and then that's when things kind of really started taking off mm -hmm. and then um i had got my mpc 1000 from there then i got my 2500 shout out to my homeboy uh a skill with uh with two for one based out express he gave me a lot of equipment uh back then because he just seen my potential and then um and then uh from that point i ended up meeting uh this kid named uh, uh jeremy mm -hmm. and uh he goes by the name of Two Pistols. And um, my guy introduced me to him. He was like, yo, this is my little cousin. Just look out for him. Just, you know, just make some beats. He'll pay you, He'll, you know, do whatever. Right. And, um, we started working for like a whole year. So he was like paying me 500 bucks for like a beat. And he was doing this like every week. And I was recording, you know, I had built the shed in the back of my dad's house. I was mm -hmm. recording a lot of people, but he was like my main guy. And then uh, one day he came to me um, in 2000 and, what was it, 2006? No, it was 2007. Okay. He came to me, he was like, yo, I want to do something big. And I was like, what you want to do? He's like, I'm thinking about getting T-Pain on this record. And I was like, okay, cool. So he gives me the record. He has his cousin singing on it. And I was like, okay, cool. So we made a beat for it. He was like, uh, let's do a different beat. So I made a different beat for it. And then uh, at the time, I think Payne had charged me like 15 grand for like a hook and a verse, but it was like under the table type of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we sent it off. Um, he sent the record back. Well, he didn't send it back. They mailed <laughs> the yeah. data back. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The snail mail, man. The snail mail yes. days. Yeah, yeah. He, he mailed the data C, data CD back. I opened it up in Pro Tools, and that time, you know, I was wow. working on the NPC, so everything yeah. was linked to Pro Tools. And then I remember, I remember this so so fondly. I remember he opened up the session, and Payne had changed all the lyrics, everything on that record. Wow. The first thing, <laughs> first thing he was like, man, he changed up the lyrics, and I'm like, I'm sitting thinking to myself, I'm like, bro, are you tripping? <laughs> Why? Because you you saw the value in that this is T Pain on the on the song, right? Like, yeah, dude, this is a smash. He yeah. just really just took this song to a whole another level. I've never heard nothing like this. Right. So um he's yeah. like, but we gotta do something, we gotta remake the beat or something. I was like, all right, cool. So, you know, I'm on the MP, so now I have to have Pro Tools tell the MP what to do. Mm -hmm. And then it still has like a couple but not a couple but a, a lot of millisecond delays so i'm trying to build the beat around the hook instead of me thinking okay sample the hook put in the mp and make the beat mm -hmm. i'm doing it through pro tools so i did all that made a beat for it recorded it he put the song out like that next day and it just blew up and then 
Um, what was the name of the song? Huh? What was the name of the song again? It's called She Got It. She uh, got featuring it. Oh. uh two is two, two pistols featuring T Pain called She Got It. Right. Um, I think right now it's double platinum, I think, right Sheesh. now. Um I did the original version, but he ended up signing a deal with the Justice League and they ended up redoing the beat over. Wow. And they got to Universal. Right. And right. that was a little controversy with that. Because I had mine, they had theirs. And a lot of they weren't bloggers back then. They were doing like the telephone calls and stuff like that on YouTube and mm-hmm. you know doing that. And, and they a lot of people was like, "Yo, why do you have two versions? Did, did you get paid off this and that?" And I didn't, I'm like, "No, I didn't make anything off of that record except for what I made on the back end because people knew I made the record. So mm-hmm. now I was selling beats for fifteen hundred, two thousand. This is when it was gravy back then. Like right. you could be an independent producer and make three thousand dollars on a beat if you were hot. See, now, so well, I, I'm about to say, you mind if I chime in here just just to ask you a yeah. question about that specifically? Because a lot of producers come, and it may be the same thing with you. A lot of producers come to me after their beats have been quote unquote stolen. Right? They've submitted it off um, for whatever reason. The rapper's team didn't keep in contact, and before they know it, the records on SoundCloud or on streaming, no paperwork yeah. has been exchanged. And the first thing I always tell them, I say, you know, most folks are going to tell you, man, lawyer up and, you know, take take them to court and, da, 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 and do all of these other things. Yeah. And I'm like, but you're also missing a very special opportunity to leverage that in your advantage, because if you are indeed the only producer on this record, you are the producer of this record and it's valuable stuff that you can put out there behind the scenes clips are. Um, and I know we're talking about a different time period, but. The fact that you were able to leverage this to run your prices up, you know, as you're doing artist work and whatnot, uh, what other what other ways are are are? Let me just say this: what other what ways were you able to really leverage that, even aside from just uh, increasing the price? Cause I think a lot of producers in here probably have questions about how they can do that now. Well, what, the way I leveraged it was, and I really wasn't even thinking about it. It was just like once people, cause it like. You know how some people like these kids now like so how did y'all you know if y'all didn't have gps how did you find such and such's house <laughs> thomas got uh, <laughs> map we <course>. had <laughs> we had maps you know what i'm saying yeah. we you know we would talk to people on the corner like hey yeah where's this house at they're like oh just go past this tree turn right here you see the green car so everything traveled by word of mouth and then i had my tag in the beat right uh... and, and so so, and, and truth be told, I wasn't the first, but I was one of the first to have a record that big that actually had a tag in it. Mm, that's huge. You know what I'm saying? So that's how a lot of people know me through my tag. Mm-hmm. So, um, cause the tag comes straight in even for the beat drops. So people are like, who is this guy who did this? Cause my version was very popular. Mm-hmm. Their version was popular because it, you know, it had the labels behind it. It had the, the marketing dollars behind it. And I never felt any type of way towards um, Justice League anybody because they're from my hometown. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I just did not know that much. Mm-hmm. I cannot fault myself for not knowing the industry when I thought all I needed to just do is just put this on ass cap and that's it. And everything taken care of. Yeah. And I didn't know. So right. when people be like, well, you, do you have a feeling type of way? No, because that's my fault. Mm. And I think a lot of people now won't take that into account. They don't take themselves accountable for things being their fault. Yep. So, yep. so what I did was I just like, okay, listen, I got guys paying me a thousand. I wasn't making no less than a thousand dollars a beat at that time. Mm. I made so much money. I moved up to Atlanta, rented a house, Moved my girl in at the time, had a studio, Mm -hmm. and then I got to work as soon as I got to Atlanta. And that money lasted me from like 2007 all the way to like 2012. Oh, wow. During the recession. So I was, I had that money, plus I had the money coming in from that. And I was still paying all my bills. I was still going out of town. I still ended up getting married at the time. It was was a lot of And this is independently, right? Independently, but I was doing other records past that so what i was doing was i was i just kept doing what i did and that was recording 
and producing and I knew that if I kept recording, mm -hmm. then I was going to stumble across somebody else. And that's why I tell a lot of producers now, don't just leverage yourself on your beats, leverage yourselves on your talents. Mm -hmm. Because if I ever hear a producer and I hear their beats and their beats are mixed really good, yeah, then I know that they could be a good engineer because they have an ear. That's going to be my and next question you, is, is how much yeah. of you being an engineer uh, was a big factor in these artists continuing to to invest in you? It was huge because I had a sound mm. and my sound was different from everybody else's in, in the city at that time. Like I was a very like, you know, I was never over compressing stuff. I just I just because I, I had recorded so many people, I had my own sound and people trusted my sound. Right, right. So while I was, I was, I had moved back home. I, I had to, it, now d don't get me wrong. I had the, the graviest of gravy times when I moved right. back home because <laughs> it was just me and my brother and my dad. Uh -huh. We were splitting the bills at the main house. I was in school at USF at the time, which I got a refund check from that. So I basically had no bills and I was making at least five to $600 a week mm -hmm. on just recording and that's not even including the two or three times a month that i was getting for a thousand to up to two thousand dollars per beat oh, so i was man. making five you know yeah. at least five grand a month with a four hundred dollar overhead and i don't think people understand maybe the majority of this audience would but understand how impactful that is to do hand to hand Right. I know a lot of producers are looking like, well, I sell this amount of beats through beat stars and through Airbit. And it's like so much of the infrastructure has been taken care of for you. Right. The the yeah. the layout is already there. These are things that you don't have to worry necessarily about how the player is coded. You get to customize and 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 do it under your understanding of what the settings are. And they take care of the, the heavy lifting. Doing this hand to hand with artists requires more than just having fire beats even requires more than just being a fire engineer there's a level of um communication and just interpersonal skills that for some people that you can't teach that right you have to learn that getting your hands dirty as you're i wanted to go back to another question way before all of this because i, I think it's important to understanding the origin of your song your sound but we're going to double yeah. back to this this part as well we missed kind of a gap in, in time and obviously you're telling a lot of things that have happened over a span of years but specifically as you were sitting down with this new device this this thing that you had saw within your friend's studio and you're sitting down trying to establish your sound where is sort of the foundation of bolo coming from who are you influenced by who was kind of like because you know when we first sit down to make beats we're just challenging the stuff that we grew up on and that we liked personally like for me it was outcast it was um, it was, you know, organized noise. It was like, it was like, it's just so many different folks that had played into who I was. I had to just get that out of my system first before I could find who Curtis King was for you. Who was that? Who was the origin of that? Man. And truthfully told, I really don't know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> because when I got into it, I got so deep into it that unless it was like at the time maybe like some masterpiece stuff or some whatever mm -hmm. because you gotta think i come from florida where it was like fast loop type style mm -hmm. music it was that love for love very love melodic love. fast island type of music so i moved to alabama where it's like <laughs> It's real, like they they're listening to UGK. They they're listening to Master P. Mm -hmm. They're listening to um, local artists that have that Alabama sound. And you know, when I got there, Pastor Troy had just came out, and you know, it was a lot of influences, but it was that deep South music, like you know, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Biggs and and all that. It was it was that. So. I just infused everything into ones. When I, I, I would try to make a little John beat, I would try to make this, I would try to make that. And um, I think the turning point for me came from the uh, God Bless the Dead, my guy Joe, 
Mm -hmm. um, he was one of my classmates, just super talented uh, uh, beyond his years, like just crazy guy who heard things differently. He was like, listen, give me all of your trash beats. I don't, everything you think is trash, give it to me. Mm -hmm. And he would make just beautiful compositions with my stuff. And then from wow. that point, I was like, you know what? I'm just thinking too hard on this. Let me just make some, if I feel like this sounds good to me, I'm just going to do it. What do you think was his purpose of, of remaking them? Kind of just show you what the potential of them was? Or do you think it was like he just was genuinely seeing the potential in them that maybe you didn't see? I think it's sometimes when have you ever been around other producers and then like as soon as they play a beat they're like oh no no not that one yeah like, hold yeah. on play that back yeah and they're like no nah, no nah, it doesn't sound that good no play that one back mm -hmm. and they play it back it's like yo that's the one right there and you like not this and it's one. almost like when you play your beat the artist <laughs> <laughs> like you play your beats the artist you're like nah they ain't gonna like this one you mm -hmm. oh god i don't want to play it and you play it they're like oh that's the one you like yo I, what look. do you need I tell you, Abso is notorious for that. He is notorious for that. I make five of them Abso type beats. This is back in like 2009, 2010. Um, and mind you, I've known him since uh, forever. But when I got into a place where I was producing for him and, and actually, you know, getting these records over to him, uh, I'd send him five or lock in with him. And the first four, he's like, uh, nah, we kind of did that already. Nah, we did that already. And then the fifth one, every single time, was some left field shit. I just some left field that I dropped in there like last yeah. minute and he's like yeah that's the one what you mean that's the one <laughs> that's that's how it is because people get they, they sometimes they just want to hear something fresh that's why when I get beats now I don't care if I got 20 beats I'm playing all 20 out of order or whatever mm. but you're gonna hit these 20 you're gonna get these 20 for sure but but a lot of times they're like yeah Bolo, because they, they, because now it's like yeah, hey, we got Bolo in the studio. Yeah, because we want to hear something different. <laughs> and it's like, and that's what it is because I I just have my own sound. And either you're really going to like it or you're not going to like it. And I just move on because I'm all 20 of those beats are going to get picked up by somebody at right. some point. Right. So, see, see. so that's the way I looked at it. And so I just infused everything into it. If I felt like making a beat like this this day, I did that. If I felt like making a beat this day. And then, and then, that's how it even is to this point right now. It's just, you know, that's that's just the way I work because, you know, working with newer artists, which, you know, we probably, you know, can segue to that, working with newer artists or whatever, you can mold people mm. better than dealing with somebody who's already got tons of placements. Like, it's different because they have their certain aspect when you work wow. with somebody new especially if they if you're working with them and they're and they're working with you on your dime mm -hmm. it's a little bit different so that's you know that's that's why i just kind of just stayed away i've i've been you know what i'm saying even with working with two pistols he'll have certain ideas but i'll be like hey let's let's kind of do it like this and he'll be like okay cool we can rock with it right and and i gotta say man just as someone that is i'm, I'm listening to your story in real time because i i do my research on my guests but you, you were a hard one to find research on uh if it wasn't just through live streams and video content or even like um i see you did a a, a talk at uh is it bricks domains uh retreat and so I, I i tapped into all these things for my usual research for my guests but um it was surprising to see like for someone who, and, and we got to get to, you know, some of these records that you've placed and, and what yeah. got you to this multi-platinum status, but it was amazing to see someone who had all of these credits and didn't necessarily seem like they wanted to be the center of attention like producers who usually have those credits. And that was something that I'll be honest with you, as I left the industry in 2010-11, that was the thing that really turned me off to it was that I was in the studio with folks who just got their first major placement but because it gave them more clout in the room i had to shut up and abide by what was going on because that was just the politics of the situation and mind you i'm in la and navigating those those industry streets and it got to the point where i was just like i got tired of knowing more than the people in the room and <laughs> and, and 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 being told by people just as smart as, as, you know, as that and saying that you that's just how you got to do. You got to be quiet. You got to know your role. You got to know when it, when is the right time to do these things. Uh, but 
I'm looking at your experience and I'm seeing or I'm experiencing your 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 uh, your content and you just don't have that industry like arrogance that I think a lot of us have grown I, accustomed to. I hate it. Really? Tell you why. I know a lot of people. A lot. Yeah. They know me. And one thing about it is I don't talk like industry folks. I don't sit around the studio and talk about, hey, you heard such and such just got a place for last week. Uh, such and such just <laughs> did this. Uh, and you know, we were at such and such office over here mm -hmm. and we and they know every single person in the industry. Mm -hmm. They know about every person's lifestyle. They know about every record that's coming out. I don't care about that. Mm. What do you care I, about? I care about, hey man, is we going to the bar tonight? What's up? We watching the game? It. I love it. You I know, are it. we are we doing that? <laughs> like, what's up? What we, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? Now, don't get me wrong. I I still have to have my ear to the to the streets of certain things, but it's not that anymore. Like, right. I don't even dress the part, and I know that. And just be honest, I'm not trying to toot my horn. And I know I got more money than a lot of these guys. Mm -hmm. But why do that? Why spend my money on that when I can spend my money on all these other investments? I got, I, you know, I'm like Grant Cardone. Yeah. You know, I'm putting my money. I'm not having wads of cash on me or wads of money in the bank. I'm buying real estate. I'm doing different investments. Right. I'm putting, some, this is what I'm doing. And I know my net worth is a lot more. Right. You know what I'm saying? Than just a whole bunch of people holding cash and looking the part. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. What? What do you think? But, what do you think is contributing to that part of the culture? I know some of that is kind of attributed. Oh, it's to all the, the internet. It's all the internet. It's all the internet because the internet, huh? you got to think about this. You know, even back in the day, yeah, rappers were, you know, rapping about. Ace and Chris and all that stuff in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you got to think these guys were promoting E and J back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> These guys were promoting uh, Seagram's Gin back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Hanging Eyes back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Incredible yeah. Hawk back in the day. Uh -huh. So it all started once media the media mm. got a, a hold of it and now the new media is the internet so now one person gets their teeth done everybody, everybody gets, gets their teeth, teeth done, done. Well, one person starts wearing space boots everybody <laughs> starts wearing space boots one person wears uh, uh, a belt yeah that's remember the lights remember the lights used to be on the belt remember the lights used to be on the belt and that was the thing yeah. for a time period well let me ask you this then. So this segues to the younger artists that you have been given a platform to, that you have been sharing your experience with and just giving them an opportunity to be seen in front of the camera as opposed to always being behind the scenes. What what did it for you that made you say, OK, I know that this is the nature of the Internet. I know that a lot of producers do operate like this. How were you able to say or like at what point were you able to say, you know what, but I'm going to look for the ones who don't and still provide a platform because I think it's easy for a lot of us to just be like I'm just not with that and my circle is my circle but you give a platform to so many different varieties of producers that are killing it right now what what was sort of that that thinking and in, 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 in pivoting there because I knew how it was for me mm. I knew that I wanted a platform but my platform back then was just trying to get into the room uh. and now that we have the internet and I have nothing but time on my hands, why not try to help out as many people as I can? Now, you got to be somewhat dope. You can't just right. be anybody. <laughs> You're not bringing anybody in there. Yeah, <laughs> but you have to have some, you have to have a referral or something. Somebody like, hey, or somebody I know is like, hey, you might want to check out this new kid. I'm like, Send me some of his stuff. Right. Okay. When can he come on? And then. They come in there sometimes they're so nervous and like, what do we want to do? I'm like, bro, just be yourself. I'm just going to ask you questions and just mm -hmm. do you. And if it takes two hours, it takes two hours, but we're going to crunch this thing down. But I I wanted to always do that because I'm not the first person who, who did it. You know what I'm saying? They had spit your game out back in the day. Uh, the same guy who started Street Jacks, Charlie. Mm -hmm. they, they did this already. Mm -hmm. You know, they were doing that. 
And then it just stopped. And I was like, you know what? I, I want to do something like that and help out producers too. Well, I mean, it, it, you know what it gives me energy of? Uh, Rap City, the basement. It gives me that energy of somebody like, told me. man, somebody I, told but me we, for somebody who went to high school when that was when that was the show, like we missed that energy. Um, even seeing like there was an Absol video with Russ uh, and they kind of recreated that with Tigger. It's like we missed that because that was a lot of the times the only way that us on the, on the West Coast would hear East Coast lyricists because it wasn't the Internet landscape how it is today. You, this is the time that you're seeing like oh this is what they're on in north carolina this is what they're on in new york okay this is what yeah. florida sounded like right now and I, that was i the, missed those days man that was the melting pot for all of that i missed those, i remember the first time i went to cali was in um 2009 for the ascap okay. awards and i heard you know i used to be now i used to have my ear to the streets in cali like i was a big brother lynch hung fan mm. back then yeah, the OG, that's right. Like Northern Cali, <laughs> I was a Drew Down person. Drew you know, Down, I knew it yeah. from North Cali. But then when I got to LA, this is when um uh what was that dance had just came out? Um, but we they, they, they were showing us this dance and then it got and ended up getting big. Mm -hmm. And then um I started noticing all these new rappers and stuff coming up. It and wasn't a jerk in there, was it? The jerk, nah, it was, jerk era? Yeah, it was a jerk. The jerk it era. was yeah, a jerk. Yeah, that was huge. Yeah, it was a jerk. Was it was, uh, it was a, my, my friend knew a girl from uh, Inglewood. We rolled through Inglewood. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we, it, beautiful houses that day, but we got there at night. It was, it got way different. Yeah, it's and misleading. Then, Inglewood is it, misleading. It, I'm from, I'm originally from Carson. That's another one of them cities uh -huh. that's like packed in between Lone Beach and Compton. And you think like, oh man, it's like Mercedes in the in the you know in the in the uh, in the driveway. I never forget. I lived on a street where, for the longest, I didn't understand why this garage was always cracked. And it, and, and I got older and realized that all of these nice two story houses and green lawns. I'm thinking everything is super cool, super cool. Come to find out, that was the crack house down 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 the way. Yeah, the folks would go. No, it's, it's, folks, I'm like, what you mean? How? How does that happen here? How? I, you know, I was comfortable because it's like kind of like the same way in Florida. Like it's, uh. it's, you know, it's the same way. But this was like a little different because the further you go down, it's like it just gets worse and worse. It's kind of like oh, okay, but we was there and these this girl had a gang of kids, mm -hmm. and you know they were some hood babies, and mm -hmm. they was out there just oh, show them the dance. Show them the, like <laughs> this is what we doing out here right now. I'm like oh. Okay, cool. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then I started meeting people at the ASCAP Awards and there was new groups and stuff. Some of these people end up becoming, you know, big and, and it's like, okay, boom. Okay, I like this mm -hmm. because I used to like going and driving in my car. Or if, I, if I would go to Chicago, I would go to Kentucky. I would hear their sound. Mm -hmm. I would go to Chicago. I hear their sound at the time. I would go over to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. I would hear their sound. Now everything is, you know, with the with the internet and everything, everything is like. The How do you same. feel about that? How do you feel about that? Because that's something I've made videos and I got a lot of pushback, um, and we got to obviously get to that as well with your YouTube channel because you've had some some topics that have uh, shook up the producer community as you should, right? <laughs> but, but the thing is, nobody how do you feel can. About it? It, it, okay, first of all, the first topic is, I. I think everything evolves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at it like this. And people didn't understand what I was saying. Right now, if you was to play a song from 1993, mm -hmm. most people would say, yeah, that song sounds like it's from the 90s. Yes. yes. Rather, yes. it's a New York song, a Texas song, a California song. It had the ingredients that sounded like the 90s. Mm -hmm. If you play the song from the 80s, you would say that song sounds like it was made From in the, the 80s. 80s. Rather, yeah. it was an East Coast or West Coast or Midwest. It sounded like the 80s. Mm -hmm. So right now, everything sounds like the 2020s. Mm -hmm. But it has a little twist here. It has a little twist here. It has a little twist here. I think only the, the most noticeable that I feel that is like that that is very much different from everything that is out is of course you know what they're doing with the drill stuff in new york right right and right. what they're doing in louisiana they're gonna keep it ratchet down there mm. at all costs and even in florida they have their own little sound but mostly louisiana stuff 
and the New York City drill is yeah, that's what it is. And everything else is kind of like been blanketed by what it is. Now, Texas still has their stuff as well. L.A., the West Coast has their stuff. But everything pretty much sounds like 2020. Anywhere. And, and I, that's I mean, maybe that's me just being nostalgic, but I miss being like, I wonder what Florida's on right now. Like, what does it mean yeah. to walk the streets? Of, yeah. What is it? What it, Like when I listen to Nas, I listen to Illmatic, I listen to any, really any Nas album, any Jay-Z. It sounds like different faces of of new york and that right. excites me because it's like i hadn't been to new york i hadn't traveled the only way i could travel was through putting up my headphones and listen to them show the sonics the aesthetics the 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 yeah. jazz influences all these things and i think in a lot of ways i mean you're so right about like florida like i love how it still stays fast paced and even they'll put like the most left field samples over these beats <laughs> but it still feels like 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 what you imagine with florida I, I love that so much, but I, I do understand with having access to the to everybody's music, everybody's style, and even YouTube to a certain degree, which is the next question I have for you. Um, but having this access to any style you want, you can try some things. Maybe if I was that age, I would want to try some things as well. But I just know yeah. growing up, I had such a huge pride in being West Coast and sounding West Coast. And that was the great thing about it. Yeah, you have pride in it. You like, you know, you know, Florida was known for the DJ stuff. Like, you, you, Florida was always known for you in the club, and the DJ was the man. Yeah, and <laughs> you, that record is gonna stop fifty times during that song. You're gonna know <laughs> one thing about Florida back in them times in the late eight, late eighties, early all through the nineties was you were gonna know who was the man in the city. Okay, who had the best food. Who was the best dancer? Who was the dope boys? Who was that? Because that DJ was going to stop and give shout outs every 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the thing back in the day. And we used to love the song, just like how, you know, uh, everybody's doing the chopped and screwed stuff, mm-hmm. you know, saying in Texas, that was their thing. Yeah. And, you know, everybody else is saying that. And right now, I think people, you know, with people sampling the older records and stuff now, I think. That's just what it is, but yeah. you can't get mad because of what 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 kids are doing, right? Because it's mm-hmm. always going to be like that. Because even right now, even the twenty year olds right now in twenty years are going to be hating on the twenty year olds. But so goes the pa- so goes the pattern of hip hop. Like I remember Ice Cube said it. Like it's not hip hop unless it's rebelling against something, and that even includes itself. So mm-hmm. they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be polarizing the folks who are older. And, uh, and and not open minded, and not saying that's that's us, because I feel like I see you embrace so much of the the, the new trends and the sounds that come come together. Uh, even your the way that you embrace social media, which should probably be one, towards the tail end of this. But walk me briefly through, or not even briefly, just walk me through. Fast forward to this 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 massive 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 record that in that time period that it came out, could none of us could none of us dodge it how did how did the 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 uh the salento record come together and uh well, at what stage did that come in well what happened was uh with that record we gotta go back a little bit sure. actually um you know once i did the stuff with two pistols mm-hmm. um i ended up meeting some writers from texas okay and it was all a part of a group and we're just going to just kind of fast forward to that point. And uh, this was in 2008. Met some writers. They were dope. I sent them over to another producer. And they ended up writing on Blame on Alcohol with Jamie Foxx. Oh, wow. That was a huge record. Never made a penny off of it. Didn't make not one Ooh. cent, but I got a, I got a Grammy plaque hanging up on the wall with my name on it. Wow. Okay. Lesson learned. Okay. Yeah. First lesson was learn the business. Second lesson was sign the writers. <laughs> you know what, what I'm saying? What what help you stay on course and not get discouraged when you got two records that are because I see a lot of producers, they all they need is one time for that to happen and they up out of here. I, because because anyway, it's a love of music. Mm. It's a love of the music and I, I feel like I, I always felt that my time was going to come. Mm-hmm. But then you got to understand, I had to feel like this during the, the recession, yeah. which was bad. I lost, I lost like at one point, I lost like 10 grand one day 
with during that recession just by investments in stock. So I had wow. to keep my head up. Mm-hmm. And then Two Pistols, he came back around. He he put me on his album, which me and C Note was on his his first album. And we got to know each other like that. And I ended up doing some stuff with him. And uh we we did a lot of cats from New York. Like he had um Man, I ended up doing a song with the, the Tech Nine. I ended up doing. I ended up doing uh, the Echo remix with R. Kelly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up, uh, um, which that never came out. But uh, Jim Jones. Uh, who else we had on the records? We had um, a lot of guys. I can't think of everybody's names right now. Yeah, I but think that's we had Chance. even that. We talking about Brother Lynch hung Tech Nine. And obviously, we're moving into to, to these records that have you know gone the multi multi platinum. But it's like that range alone, you don't hear that in people's credits. It's usually artists that, when you put an artist name and you put similar artists to this artist, that's kind of people's credits generally. But yeah. the fact that you're able to have such a wide range of sound, I mean, that's to me that's that's hats off and credits to the producer who's able to yeah, get I, in those worlds. Know. I'm chop. I used to chop samples. I used to do all that stuff. Like right. I, um, I had did a song with Joel LTs. That thing was it was hard. Oh, he man. went on. He went stupid on one. But um, I think I think another big change happened when um, I started working with Kevin Shakespeare Briggs. I started working at his studio because we had a I had an artist I was working with. The guy had an artist. We ended up getting him signed. That situation kind of dissolved. But I I still ended up working over there with him, like engineering and just learning the craft of producing he was an all world producer at the time he produced everybody mm-hmm. and um then i met this kid named uh doby that that uh was with ti's camp mm-hmm. and doby already had a song out because i was seeing his song on mtv it was like bt jams and all that stuff and he came to the studio and um we did his uh i was doing his first big mixtape called uh, baby jesus and that I did three records on that. I could have did more records because he picked all my records. But the first night we ended up doing um, a song called uh, Trap Music, okay, which was huge. And then I did another record called Smile and another record called I Don't Give a You Know. We did that, and uh, that blew my name up like in the South because Dobie was like going to be the next like Biggie, like he had a mm. crazy bugs, right? Right, and you got to think on that album. It was me. It was uh, Ke on the track. It was Metro Boomin on there. Wow. Zay Tobin. Um, Eight Oh Eight Mafia. Yeah. Uh, Honorable C Note. The heavy hitters, like, man. <laughs> all us. All us produced on that. I, crazy, I call the album. Man. That's the whole zoo right there. That's crazy. Crazy, and you see where all us. Was, you see where all them at. Right, <laughs> you right, know what I'm right. saying. But um, that got it got me prepared because it, it's like now I'm meeting people like I, you know, I, I mean, when I was on the road with Silento, we went to the Sirius Satellite and the guy who's the assistant to the vice president was like, yo, you're a bolo produced for Dope B. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'm a huge fan. I'm like, what? I like, wow. It's crazy. Bless the dead. He, he ended up dying. He ended up getting killed in the club. Wow. But um, it set me up to where now people were bringing certain people to me and then a friend i knew ended up bringing silento to me but he was in a group and he brought him to me that december before adobe died he brought me to that december and they did a song with the group then we just they paid me they left mm-hmm. and then like six months later he starts hitting up my phone like now he actually hits me up on uh either it was twitter or instagram he's like yo i want you to work with me i'm like why is this little 14, 15 year old kid hit me up. He was 14, he, 15. Yeah. I mean, he was young, but he's like 14, 15. That's yeah. wild. Like, I think I think it was like 15 or six. He was 16 right. at the time when he hit me up. And uh, he just kept hitting me up. And I'm like, ah, all right, let's just do one session. Yeah. So we did one session with his group. The other group member was heavily deep into his studies because he went to a private school and they were like, he couldn't really get out so you know at the time his name was ysk little rick he uh he went solo mm-hmm. and then i was working at the studio and we were just 
you know, the studio owner was cool because we did a we did a favor for him because at the time his people had his kid named Sean Sloan. If you know who Sean Sloan is, he's a big artist out of Philly mm -hmm. now. And uh, he was the same age and we did a record and, you know, they looked out. So the owner was like, yo, I know your studio's going through some renovation stuff. Just stay over here. You know, I got you. Mm -hmm. So uh, from you. that point, we just kept working. And then all of a sudden this kid just comes and like, hey, I got this song. It's going to be a hit record. And I'm like, what's the song called? <laughs> He's like, it's called, it's called Watch Me Nay Nay, Watch Me Whip. It's 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 both dances Jeez. put together as one. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, no. <laughs> you just said no, no, that's not no. the move. That ain't it. <laughs> that's not it, Rick. We gotta do some other stuff. We gotta do these other right. dances and all this other stuff. He's like, I'm telling you. So he was actually going to do the record with somebody else. Mm -hmm. But I, and my homeboy and everybody says, if you would have did that record with anybody else, it would have never did what it did because it's just, you know, yeah. it's, it's certain things. Why do you think he has and so like, much confidence in it? Like, because you, you, you said he called you, he was following up, he was reassured that this is a hit. At that age, to have such, like, foresight, like, you have to have some kind of evidence of, of something around you. What do you think it was for him? It's part of that, part a little bit crazy, part a little bit young, <laughs> okay, and whatever, you know what I'm saying. But you know, he was a good kid. You know what I'm saying. It's just that you know he had, he had that young confidence. He all he was very confident, and, and he would speak directly to you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, he just kept he just kept asking like, "Yo, I'm telling you, uh, I'm telling you, man, this is a hit record. I could have took it over to somebody else who did it, but I want you to do it." And so we were working on a song one night, mm -hmm. and uh, my wife at the time she had just we had just had twins and it's I remember the night because the same night I made a record is my my youngest son's birthday now December seventeenth, twenty fifteen. So um, we're we're in there and we're 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 doing the record and he cannot come up with no verses for this hook we had it's called Duff him it was like a dance record mm -hmm. and he actually puts it in the song. And then he was like, man, we don't need to do this. We need to do this record. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, he has to be to school the next day. It's like eight o'clock, something around there. <laughs> that is and wild. I'm like, all right, listen, <laughs> we got 45 minutes. That's all we got. So I go in there. I, I'm working on logic at the time. Right. I put up Nexus and Purity and some drums. And I make the beat literally. I made that beat literally in between eight to ten minutes. Okay. So break this down to me just really quick. Because I, I know that you, this is part of your story as well. But I have a like a quick segue. In, not segue, segue. But, but uh, I want to I make, a, make a turn on this one. When you say you make a beat in eight minutes, what, what constitutes a beat in that short period of time? Because I'm like. Bruh, for those of y'all that say that, I'm like, how? How? I'll be sitting here like eight minutes. I spend 22 minutes in the first part of my live stream just talking to the audience. Eight <laughs> minutes, like eight minutes. What does that look like? And, and, and we're saying the beat is kind of pretty much done. Are we talking about like a full loop? What does that look like? Basically, I start off with um, the first thing I started with, because he was singing the hook. He came to me. He was like, I need to beat like this. He was like, watch me, Nene. Now watch me whip. Uh -huh. Now watch me nay nay. Now watch me whip. Now watch me nay nay. And, and he kept doing like that. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I was like, no. Nah. I said, listen, switch that around. Say watch me whip. Yeah. Watch me nay nay. And he kept. He was like, watch me whip. Watch me nay nay. And he was like, watch me whip nay nay whip. And I was like, no. Nah. I said, we gotta, we gotta make this sound like. We worked on it a little bit, and yeah. then we got the melody. It's like, now watch me, nay, nay, now watch me whip. And so I was like, okay, that's close enough. This that's whole conversation, by the way, is hilarious. I just, just the, the fact that y'all sat there, and, and and I'm sure it's a prolonged session where you got to have so many thoughts crossing through your mind, like, what are we doing? I'm sitting there thinking, like, <laughs> why? Well, but the thing about it is, he's a kid. He's right. in high school. He's staying. He, he's staying out of trouble. Yeah, that's and it's already late. Thing. And he has to catch the martyr. Like he used to do a lot just to get to the studio because he stayed 40 minutes away from the studio just to get there. So he used to go right. through a lot. He was never on time, but he got there and I, and I could respect it. Right. Right. So I was like, okay, at least we can just finish this up, whatever. So I start with the bell, the, the bell you hear in the song, mm -hmm. bloom, 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 
bloom, bloom. That was to keep him in key. That's all that bell was for. Right. Was to keep him to sing it that way because I that's the way I heard it. Mm -hmm. Then I started with the strings. Dun 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 dun. And if you listen, I actually mess up on the note in the strings, but nobody never catches that. <laughs> and then Did none of us hear that. That's what now I'm about to go back and listen. Now you got me about to go analyze you can the record. Barely hear it, but it's in it. <laughs> that's crazy. But um, and then the 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 next thing I do is I add a do 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 do. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much it and then wow. i add the percussion in there and then there's no 808 in there i use the bass from nexus in there and i play that wait and that then was that's a bass from it, nexus it was a bass from nexus yeah what? There's no 808 in that song i, I promise you that was to me i feel like the driving force of the beat was like the way that, that that the way that that sub bass hit felt like an eight oh eight. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you some. I'm gonna tell you another part about it. And I actually do a beat breakdown of that mm -hmm. on um R and bass on their on their page. I did it when I still had my dreads and everything. We I went to, I was in L A. and we we did it a uh, beat breakdown. Right. But um. But uh, um. That was pretty much it. And then I added the. You know, the claps, the cymbals, all that stuff, hi-hats, all that stuff, got that done. Mm -hmm. And it literally, it worked just like that. And then from there, I didn't mix the beat. I just leveled everything out. Mm -hmm. And then I told them to go into the booth, and we put down the hook. The hook, I'm, and I'm sitting here like, this is the craziest thing I'm sitting like. This is <laughs> crazy, but I got to do it. Right. And then he comes in, and he hits the hook the right way. Oh, and wow. then he hits it the right way, but then he just strays off into some other scenes. Like, now watch me whip. Now watch me nay nay. Uh -huh. And he's like, now watch me whip. Now he was trying like, to get that vocal no. off, and you was not letting that happen that session. <laughs> no, because, no, this is this is not happening. So I cut it. And I said, stack it. Stack that. And he stacked it. And right. then I told him to come out the booth. And I said, listen, we have to have a different part right here mm -hmm. where, you know, it's it's something goes right here. We can't just keep saying this over and over again. Mm -hmm. and he was like, you know, because like people are gonna be watching you like do the dance. He was like, that's what it is. Watch me. Uh, ooh, watch me, watch me, watch ooh. me, watch me. Ooh, watch me, watch me. And so I said, go in the booth and say it. So he says it, ooh, watch me, watch me, ooh, watch me, watch me, ooh, watch me, watch me. And so what I did was. I took that and I took the other parts to ooh watch me and I cut those so I did the ooh 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 ooh. So I I took that part and just cut it and made it into the second part of the hook. Right. Got that done. Then the it tank tank came time for the verses. I was like, okay, we got to put some verses in the song. So he goes in the booth and he just starts freestyling some crazy stuff and I'm like, yo, no, come out here. I said, bro, this is a dance record. What's crazy just, stuff? We talking about like it, 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 did 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 Watch Me Whip original version was it like was it like aggressive? Was it like on some other? <laughs> it was like ooh, Watch Me Come to the Floor. Ooh, and I'm like uh, no, okay, no, it, was, okay, it, okay. it wasn't like that, but it was like something like that. I was like no, 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 no. not doing that. Right. <laughs> I said this needs to sound like one long hook. Man, that's I that said right so, there's great a producing, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that right there. Great A producing right there to be able to sit through that and not only say, you know what, I don't see it right now, but I'm still going to produce you through this for the best results possible. That takes yeah. that takes a certain type of individual to get that done. That's crazy, man. We we it's almost like we had to get it done because everything went wrong that night. The compressor broke that night. Mm -hmm. Um the other compressor we had broke. We had the UA uh the Universal Audio Compressor, the LA two A went out. Mm -hmm. The uh the one of the tubes went out in the 737. We still had a we still had a wow. UA to seven. We had an Apogee uh, interface that wasn't working right with the cord because the cord was messed up. Mm -hmm. And then we had to record the song 
you know, we got some parts of Apogee, but we had to record the majority of the song on a on a inbox three. The whole the rest is like 90% of that song was recorded on the inbox three. In 45 minutes. You can't tell me that ain't divine and intervention at that 45 minutes. Like what? What? Yeah. All elements. See, that, that, was, if, let that be me. That that session probably would have been. I wouldn't have had that. I wouldn't have had that hit. Yeah, it <laughs> was better crazy. Than me. Cause, <laughs> cause, <laughs> yeah, I had to do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then and then it was crazy because like my my wife at the time, she was like, okay, man, you, the, the twins are crying. It's time mm. to get home. And then I'm like, how are we going to finish these verses? I'm like, what are we going to do? I said, listen, bro. I said, you just need to incorporate some dances in here and just let it be what it is. You just freestyle some stuff. Mm -hmm. And this kid says the most remarkable line that I've ever heard that could go perfect on any dance record for the first line of a dance record. Mm -hmm. He says, do the stanky leg. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, do the stanky leg. Let's start off with but that. He sing, but the way he sings it, yeah, it brings out the song. Without that line, it, and some people are like, I don't, I get what you're saying now, because that line set the tone for the rest mm -hmm. of the verse. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I had him freestyle the stuff in there, and we did like a couple takes of freestyle. And then what I did was I he needed a bridge, so I took the first the the last part of the first verse and made that the bridge. Right. And then it just sounds like one long hook. Man, let let me tell you, and and I think I was living in Rialto at the time here out out in California, and uh my 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 girlfriend at the time had little cousins. Oh my God, the love they had for that song and how many times I walked from room to room. Like I, they were in the same house, Bolo, <laughs> playing the song at different timestamps. Like while the other room is talking about, you know, watch me whip, the song has started over and they're playing that first bell, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the bell melody. Like it's in all different parts of the house in different times. That song was huge. It was humongous. And, and, and not to cut you off. No, for sure. The crazy thing about that song is the 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 version that you hear on iTunes mm -hmm. is the exact same version and exact same mix I did that night. That night where everything was going on. Even, the iTunes version is not mastered. I did go home and did cut it up and do, do a few things. I did run some of the sounds through the MPC and stuff like that, right. the beat stuff. Maybe kind of beef up a little bit, but I didn't do anything. And I'm going to tell you my vocal chain on that. I used, because all the compressors went out, so I had to make an aux bus, and I put an R compressor, and I put an SSL on there, and I had a little kiss of compression going in through the aux mm -hmm. just to have something sounding analog-y mm -hmm. going into there. And then so far as his aux, his vocal aux, I used an R compressor, a SSL channel on waves, and a de -esser. Wow. I used that one and I used a R. Uh, I made another ox and made a, 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 R, a R verb and a H. And it was a, I, don't, I don't think it was an H delay. I think it was just one of the regular delays on that. And that's it. That's one wild. channel. Everything flew through one channel the hook, the verse, the chorus. And I just leveled everything out and I slapped the L2 on there. And, and that's it. Please, I, I hope the producers in the room are listening, especially the ones who are doubting putting music out and obviously you know we're, we're not i'm not saying this to say that you're gonna have a smash hit like bolo had with, with salento but i'm saying that when it's out there in the world and the energy is right behind the source audio behind what you created and you're just going off of instinct and you're doing not what needs to be perfect but just what needs to be the next step and what feels right you never know what the results of that can be and uh, I think I think you just you, you said a lot without having to say a lot with that story, because I mean, look at what that song. I mean, that's that's part of the culture forever. Someone said I was a classic in the dance era. That's the beauty of making a record that huge is that you're forever a part of a conversation. You're forever a part of an era. Yeah. And and like I tell people all the time. You can't and a lot of people are trying to make me like we need another record like that you can't make it yeah, because not like that to have a hit record like yeah you can have some very good records sure. but to have a hit record you need the perfect beat the perfect hook the perfect timing mm -hmm. the perfect artist 
the, the perfect every everything has to align up perfectly to do that. Yeah. That's why it's not so many like that. That's why Old Town Road is like that. It was everything aligned. You have to release the song perfectly. Everything has to go perfectly. Mm-hmm. So let, let me let me ask you this then. This is not this wasn't even on the, the list of questions I had, but with there being so many unpredictable elements that equal out to these songs. Because I, I what I love doing, I love watching behind how this song became famous. Vice City has a series in which they've covered how uh, Shaggy, It Wasn't Me became such a smash hit. They talk about how the Rick Rolled song found new life in this era. Because these things are so up to unpredictable elements, why are there so many people convinced they have the formula? And why do they, why do you, why do people listen knowing very well as they talk to you and they, and they hear about all the unpredictable elements of this like, why is that, like, why does the industry kind of, I don't want to say get away with it, but why is it so much uh, emphasis on people who have the formula or think they do? They, nobody has the damn formula. Mm. Even the highest a the highest musicians, there are some incredible songs out right now. Right. Incredible songs that will never go gold, hmm. but they are incredible. There are some songs, there's a song out right now that I don't know who made it. I never heard the song. It's, there's a song somewhere right now that's going to be a big record mm-hmm. that somebody did at their house because mm-hmm. everything's going to line up. I don't know if it's going to happen this year or next year. I'm just happy to be a part of that club. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. But at that time, I figured out something. Hmm. What I figured out during that time was YouTube was a wild, wild west back then. Yeah, and you know that's that's a, that's a huge question I got for you is how did you find your way here? Because in that regard, I don't know of any like nowadays. I, I mention folks like the homie Dame Taylor, right? Who 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 yeah. who's coming from a, a an industry background is trying to get the lay of the land of, of how it looks here now. With as many folks as you're connected with, as many folks respect you in the industry and almost to a certain degree expect some level of availability or, or, or to be able to compensate you for your time. What brings you to, to a YouTube? Well, what happened was, okay. And just to back things up. Sure. And I'm gonna make yeah, my, my bad for jumping all over the place, but I mean, you, you're bringing up some no, no, really no, no, no. great points. I just like to have real conversations. That's where I am. Absolutely. But, um, the song was going to be big. And the dilemma was, do we stay independent or do whatever? But I was like, you know, this song has is, is got to be signed. But, you know, I already knew some a rs at the time, and they would hit me up directly because they heard my tag. And they was like, Bolo, hey, uh, we worked together before. Let's go ahead and get this thing going. We've seen the numbers. Everything is cool. Now I'm kind of like, oh, let's just outweigh the options. Mm-hmm. But during that time, um, we had put I had put the song out on TuneCore. And I put the song out on TuneCore. I did uh, my actually my my homeboy. He was another rapper. He actually did the artwork for the song. <laughs> he actually did the artwork, and all I had to do was send him a few beats. That's so crazy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, bro? Like we talk about one of the biggest songs in hip hop history. Being, I mean, and I know that's a common thing more nowadays, but like it just blows my mind to hear, like how. Because when we get it on the other side, we think immediately this is a major label situation. This is someone who is. Uh, obviously, you know, kind of been brought through the major label system. And by the time it gets to us, folks have, you know, kind of gone through their networks. But the fact that this is the origin of the song, I think, is um, it's a beautiful story because the majority of my audience are or at least identify themselves as independents and, and they're proud of that or DIYers. So to hear you talk about how much you were you were doing hands on from the record down yeah. to the distribution of it is crazy. Yeah, went through TuneCore. They the first the first uh cover we had got rejected because it was an iPhone in the cover. <laughs> I had TuneCore. So, I know that. I know they they strict about that for sure. Yeah. So then then the second cover, I hit up my guy Picasso. He's a he's a he's a rapper at a mobile. Okay. And he does a lot of stuff. He's dope. Him and his brother make dope videos and everything. And I knew he was a graphic guy, so I hit him up, and I was like, I just need this. It's called Watch Me. He took a picture of Rick when he took a a, 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 a picture in his bathroom. Mm-hmm. That picture of the Watch Me cover is Rick in the bathroom with doing a selfie. And he got it to where he put him inside of a TV and did that actual cover. 
it was a genius. Wow. And it looks really good. You know what I'm saying? That's so crazy. I'd never heard this story look, before. So I'm like in real time, I'm getting goosebumps. Just to me, that's the nature of living in the right now is the opportunities we have to, you know, even design it for ourselves with things like Canva and whatnot and having access. I know you've done videos with DistroKid. That's a huge partner over here. We just have so much at our disposal that, you know, you don't have to necessarily pick a yeah. side, quote unquote. You can do it whatever you want to do on your own. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Y'all, y'all make sure y'all hit up his distro kid link. You're going to save seven. It's still seven percent, right? It's still seven percent. If you don't want to do it yeah. right now, go to one of Bolo videos. And when you see all that mention, go and sign up there, too. We Look, it, we, we can share you know that. What I'm saying? Make sure you get that distro <laughs> kid. But um, because that's distro. awesome. They're great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but what happened was when we did the tune core thing, and I'm gonna say you how it, but we had to have help too. What happened is there was a young lady by the name of Camille, mm -hmm. uh Broussard. She she worked over at TuneCore and she worked on the video side. We were not signed to TuneCore. We just had the song over there. Mm -hmm. That was it. Because you know, TuneCore, you know, these these companies only charge you one time and that's it. Yeah. She came to me, it was like, yo, I think we can find a way to blow this song up. And I was like, usually I would just turn down everything. I was like, talk to me. Right. So she was like, hey, if we can get permission, because he's underage, we can get permission from his guardians. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is we're going to take the song and we're going to give it to YouTube's 50 top dancers that are signed on by this Ooh. company called the Dance On Network. That's big brain. This is where right YouTube, because during that time, YouTube was a wild, wild west. Right. And, and it was it was people on there, but it's not like how it is now. Mm -hmm. So it was very open to everything, especially in this lane. So we got everything signed up. And almost immediately, we got those 50 top dancers in the world to dance to it. And this is where people thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. The deal was that they danced to the video. And the monetization goes back to the dancers. That's brilliant. We didn't get any monetization for those 50 videos. Wow. My mind was thinking, that's perfect. Let them get the money. Let them keep their money. Wow. But it's going to spawn other people to do it. Because that was the thing. People were not doing that on Instagram and stuff at that time. They were doing that on YouTube. Because Instagram wasn't really a video thing. They had the video, but it was very short, if you remember. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so they started that in March of 2016. And the song blew up mm -hmm. on YouTube. And there was so many videos, so many videos. And then what happened was before we even signed the deal to Capital, because we, we went at it with, with Capital because they really didn't have much going on over there like so far as like r&b hip-hop and stuff like that they mm -hmm. probably had like mary j and maybe like neo or somebody and they had another guy that was signed with qc over there that blessed us so he ended up uh getting killed in new orleans um but um uh, we signed with them before we even signed that deal that song was already gold we already did 75 Indie. million Indie. independent gold and it was on its way to platinum Wow. And before he even, because the big rollout with Capital was, we want to have him come on Good uh, Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like they're, because I guess their season starts in the summertime, okay. something like that. It was like their first big show. So like Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. All these celebrities were there. And that was his first major debut, period. We had did some spot shows and stuff like that, but that was his first ever big thing. Literally a kid from nothing and bam, you on Good Morning America. And then the crazy part about it was it was the same week as the BET Awards. So all this stuff, we flew to L.A. first, flew to New York, stayed there, then flew back to L.A. for the BET Awards. It was crazy. Right. That's we did that. Man. When he stepped out on that stage, that song was already past platinum. Wow. And then it just kept steamrolling, steamrolling from there. And then I, I, I was sitting there thinking, I was like, I got to catch this wave. So there was another record that he did with this kid named Darwin. I ended up writing his verse for him on that. Same thing. Darwin's record was going big on YouTube. Now his Darwin's record right now is two times platinum. Then there was an, um, another little girl by the name of Sophia Grace. She was, she was real big, like on uh, the Ellen show. Cause Ellen was bringing out all these dancers and it spawned a whole dance thing with D-Lo. Mm -hmm. Um, 
uh, the, the, the D-Lo Shuffle, uh, um, with the, the Hit the Quan, yes, all these records. So many of them at that time, yeah. And I was, we was all on tour, we was all affiliated with all these people. And then so I was like, we got to keep this thing going. So we ended up doing with Sophia Grace. And I just found out, I didn't even know until I got with uh, uh, Muso.ai that her record just went platinum. Mm -hmm. So I got another platinum record wow. with her. I wrote his verse on that. Yeah. And then I turned around, I got another group that I was working with uh, that my partner was like, yo, it's this group, these girls called the Taylor Girls. Um, they seemed pretty cool. And I, I knew who they were, but I was like, I don't really want to do anything because I was just gotten on tour with Silento and then all that stuff and artist relations and uh, artists with money and all that stuff like that. It was just, it just was different because I'm not an industry person. I, I like to have fun. I got tired of flying. Yeah, we flew to different countries, but it was like, we have to literally fly there, get off, go do the show do this, do press, do this, do that, and then leave back out. I want to go see what's going on. I want to sightsee. Right. <laughs> so it's like, I was. At, I kept telling him, at, I was like, at some point, I can't manage you because I was the producer. I was right. the manager. I was setting up all the show dates with me and my uh, my guy who was our booking agent. Yeah. We was, I was doing all of that while I still had twins, you know what I'm saying, That's, at the house. Look, somebody said, somebody said, uh, uh, Diavani said, I know Bolo was on tour probably hitting that nanny about a thousand times did, did, <laughs> did you did, did 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 you did you did you fall into the to the to the, to the, the hit the nene were you in the no. spirit after after that were you like no. you know what at first i wasn't really really with it but after a few thousand times of my production credits on there that didn't change no 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 i didn't no the, the main thing about it was as much how, as, as big as that song was yeah. i never to this day still don't treat it like that i just wow. i just look at experiences as being fun yeah that's real you know what i'm saying like people are like man you had a huge record i'm like i was working <laughs> like i was working <laughs> like monday through mm -hmm. thursday the labels calling this going on this award show that award show this that whatever whatever all this stuff was going on yeah. and i'm still producing for other people and then, you know, I had to get off that train. But then I turned around and started working with the Taylor girls. And then I I pretty much knew. I told them, I was like, look, we got to catch this before it really goes down. I said, if you do what I, you know, if what I mentioned and just work hard, right. within a couple of months, you can have a deal. Within six months, they end up getting a deal with RCA. And then now their record just went gold. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was it was That's... that time. And, it, and I just found out that in 2016, mm -hmm. I was the number two producer in the world that year for hip hop. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I think Tony Fad was number one because he had the Trap Queen record, which right. people that don't was know. Huge. That was a huge record as well. Yeah. People don't know this. This is something a lot of people don't know. I got approached to redo that beat before it got big. And I turned it down because when I heard the record, I was like, this sounds like some ghetto opera stuff. <laughs> it was, but 17. It was that for that yeah. season that my, he ran my it for that season. Wink, That's wild, man. My homeboy Wink gave me the opportunity because he knew the Nick the Grit and all them. And he was like, yo, they need somebody to redo the beat because they got the beat from online. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to redo the beat. And I was like, I ain't going to redo this. It's not even my style of music right, at the point. Right, right. But then the song blows up. I'm like, dang, I should have did it. But if, <laughs> but if I if I would have did that record, I would have never did the Silento record. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I think it would have threw everything off. So but, so being in an environment where you have so many different opportunities like that, and I don't want to stray away from you. I think I might have cut you off on accident. But what keeps you so grounded? I mean, I I, I imagine being a father of twins, being a husband. There's things that kind of center you, right? That 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 remind you that at any given point in time, this whole world can change. But what would you say are the things that were really centering you to stay focused on? Hey, we got to strike while the iron's hot. We got to keep working because a lot of people will get caught up in that moment. Like, what 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 do you think is 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 at the is at the foundation of you staying so grounded during that time? Number one, I see Ayo Sean on here. No, I did not do the dance. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he I said he said you came up with it. He started up a whole another rumor. He said you came up with the dance. <laughs> He said you you didn't do all that arguing not to come up with the dance. That's what he said. I, don't nah, know. I didn't. I think I might have did it one time when they gave us like the platinum award at the at the Capitol conference. I think but uh, I, I was I was drunk and it was crazy. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but it was the the first experience because you got to think I had in 2012. Man, I was done. Like I, all my money was exhausted and everything. Mm -hmm. 
And I had just came back from Vegas. I was like, listen, we're going to go to, you know, my wife at the time, we're going to go to Vegas and we're going to just spend it up. And, I, and 2013, I got to figure this out. And 2013, I ended up making January 2013, I'm making five grand that month. So I, I was like, oh, I could still do this. Okay, right, cool. Right. And, and uh, I knew how I was when I had got that first bag, when I had all that money from just people giving me money and money and money. And I was spending, I was buying clothes, shoes. Cars with the big rims and paint jobs and this, that, uh, oh, change. You was, that I don't you, even, I don't even know what happened to change worth. and stuff like that. You was getting your dollars worth. you you going to make that investment, everything that you need to. I hear you. Yeah, but then this time around, I was like, I'm not going to do that because I, I went through it. That's why I say with most artists, when they, I like, when you get your first bag, bro, you're going to spend it. Yeah. No, I'm not going to do that. You're going to spend it. I said, but just, just understand that it's not going to last forever. Yeah, see that you, you I might I, get a second chance. I, I didn't okay, see I this is when I wish I had big bros like you coming up because my bag didn't come from any placements, right? None of the placements I got were ever a bag big enough for it to last past the debt that accumulated between the the placements. It wasn't until I started selling beats online that I actually start to see on a monthly basis like G's coming in and then it reached, you know, ten G's and twelve G's and eventually twenty G's and I'm like, yo, wait a minute. And nobody ever told me what to do in case your dreams come true or in case you make that money. And boy, oh boy, Bolo, stupid stuff. Like I had to sign a contract for a place for, for an independent placement with an artist named Prof. He needed me to sign the paperwork the same day. I was like, you know what? I could go down here to Staples or I could go just buy a printer. Like that was my nerdy, my nerdy flat. I wasn't buying no cards. I would just, I was like, I'm going to buy a whole ass printer to, to print one piece of, piece of paper. And like just a little, little nerdy stuff like that. And I would get that and I brought it home and I was like, there's to me, that's more dangerous because it doesn't feel dangerous. It's like, you, you like, you, you, of course, you just need, you, you need everybody to print her. Little stupid stuff like that, that, bro, it. The money was getting spent faster than it came in. Yeah. But, you know, but this time around, like. I knew better. Yeah. Hey, some point. I could have did a million dollar, two million dollar pub deals. And some guys are still doing that right now. Right. I didn't want to do it because I knew the, the amount of records I would have to turn in and all that stuff. So I did just an admin deal. And they and I actually, I was with TuneCore first mm -hmm. because I had signed up with them. They did an excellent job. I needed to be with a bigger company that can negotiate a little bit more. So I went with Warner Chapel. Okay. And um, and I'm still signed to them to this day. They're still doing a great job. Um, but even when I got my first publisher check, I didn't ask for the gusto. Because I knew what I had. Mm. I just needed enough to say, okay, let me get enough to where I can get me a newer house. You know what I'm saying? My family's expanding. Let me get that. Uh, it wasn't even about getting no cars and stuff at that time. It was nothing. Right. Let me just be able to get a house. You know what I'm saying? Get the dream house that I wanted. So I got that. And, uh, you know, I ended up taking care of all of that stuff. I ended up paying off my house. And then I started doing real estate stuff. And I started doing all this other stuff and making Money like that. I was still selling beats online too on SoundClick. So you had the multiple doing streams. That. The multiple streams were occurring at this point in time. Yeah. So I was still doing that. And I wanted to feel like I was still working. Like even my studio here in Atlanta is built almost exactly like my studio here because I want to feel like I'm still coming up. Mm -hmm. I don't want to feel like I'm there because too many people feel like they're there and they feel like I don't have to do nothing else. And that stagnant point will mess people up. That's why I get on here and do YouTube videos, because let's just be honest. A producer, you're going to work more times in the night than you do during the day, man. So during the day, I basically live like a retiree. I'm around nothing but retirees. So I kind of know how to live like them now. Mm -hmm. I know what to do. I know to go to Walmart every day. I know to <laughs> do this, do that, cut the line. You know, like even my neighbor, he knew who I was. He, he, he do the same things. Right. <laughs> you know He's a music guy. Okay. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? So why everybody's like, well, how do you have time to do YouTube? Because I have time. But I don't want to be stagnant because once you get stagnant, you have to keep practicing. I have to keep practicing making beats. I have to keep practicing um, recording. I have to right. still deal with artists, even though I'm not, I'm not as driven as I used to be with the artists. I even I do have artists that I deal with that is doing pretty cool, but mm -hmm. I haven't really just dove in because I haven't heard nothing that I really like. Well I, I heard stuff like I just I just haven't got to that point yet. Right. But 
I still will have to feel like I'm coming up. If I don't feel like that, mm -hmm. then I just get real antsy and I just feel you start to get real lazy. And well, you, that, then that's when you see people just traveling for no apparent reason, buying shit for no apparent yes. reason. Excuse me. Donna, you good. Buying, you good. You know, buying stuff for no apparent reason. You know what I'm saying? And well, getting things that don't make any sense. Right. So I wasn't going to do that this time. That's why I like our sport stuff for people. Give me like Wakanda Atlanta. They have a shirt company. Mm -hmm. uh, I support different people. If people are like, hey, bro, I got this. I got this company. Can you just throw it on your IG real quick? I put on my, I'm not going to put on my main. IG. I put on the stories. I, right. I do it like that. you've been my homeboy for 20, 30 years. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. I still go to the grocery store. If I see people that be like, yo, can you check out my beats? Yeah, play them right now. I got you. You know, that's dope. I, that's dope. If I'm, if I'm on the belt line, I'm walking, and if somebody wants to have a conversation, I stop and I have a conversation with people. Man, I man. don't ever want to feel like I'm bigger than what I am. I know in this world that people get hot. And this is where every producer out here, yes, you will have your hot moment. But Every producer has a hot moment, then they have a cold moment. Mm. And then you have those producers who have hot, cold, hot, cold, like like Metro. Metro has a hot, but he never really goes cold. He just kind of simmers. Right. <laughs> and, and he goes back hot. And it, it, or he'll you know just disappear saying? for a little bit, right? He'll disappear. Yeah, and, 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 he's and like, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to make it cold. I'm I'm gonna make it cold. On my, my terms, yeah. He's On my time, demand. but I yeah, turn the AC, yeah. I turn the heat up in a second. Yeah, he, it's but it's it's very few people like that. But Metro has always been like that. He's been just a, mm -hmm. even when he was young. You know what I'm saying? You, even how he talked, his mindset was different from a lot of people. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Same way yeah. with even like we were talking with Honorable C Note. C Note makes beats every single day. Man, He's a mad man. scientist how he makes his beats. If you ever see how he makes his beats, all the keyboards and stuff he got, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a mad scientist, but he does this every day and he produces for people that you've never heard of that might have a buzz. He produces for big people all the time. He has his packs ready. Mm -hmm. He sends his stuff out. He's diligent on what he does, but then he still has time to, hey, bro, uh, shoot, let's go, let's go walk four miles or something real quick. Cool. Or he'll go be boxing or something, or he'll yeah. show up to an event. That's what it's about. You know, you know what I'm starting to get? I, I think that may be also partly a regional thing as well in that I'm like, why are there not more folks like Bolo over here? Why don't I hear more stories of folks who understand that the secret to your longevity doesn't lie in just your ability to make hot music, but your character and, and people wanting you to be around, especially when folks are easily replaceable. And I hear you say that. I hear you talk about the hunger and, and uh, doing as Biggie said on 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 the outro to that one Jay Z song on, on the Black Album. He said, "Treating your first day, uh, treating your treat treating every day like it's your first day. That energy yeah. keeps you keeps you excited. It keeps your music. Um, you have to worry about rev relevance because it's it's in the energy that goes into the music. But unfortunately, so many people fall victim to ego. So many people fall victim. They 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 believe the hype." And when I hear you describe these things, like one of the questions I had, I kind of feel like you started answering it, even though I still want to ask it is. Did you ever feel any hesitation or that there would be any kind of like industry backlash from your relationships for having a YouTube channel? Was that ever a thing for you? Nah, because it was just my channel. Like, See, but I, like I just I, am. I start That's I wild. literally started that YouTube channel. I'm going to tell you when I started it. OK. I started. I think I, I I think I signed up for it in like 2012, mm -hmm. but I ain't really do like my first video to like after that. And I remember I was going through a dark point, and I was talking to my guy, and he was like, "Listen, everything you talking about, you know, because he used to be like a big dude, and he ended up getting caught up in the system with that. Right. And he came out of it. He made it. He made it out of it, and he made it out of a really bad car crash. And he was telling me it's like everything that you pretty much go through." You know what I'm saying? Is you. Mm. Nobody else. It's you. You put yourself through that. You're not doing the things that you're supposed to do. You're not taking that extra step. Right. If you have a car, a place to stay, and you're able to walk and you're able to create, there is no excuse for anybody in this music game. But 
You got to be dope, though. Yeah, don't that you, you can't you can't just be humble your way through 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 uh through mid beats. That's just not that's not that's <laughs> you said that's not part of the formula. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be dope. But if you're dope, right, and you're lazy, somebody like me mm-hmm. will always pass you because I'm not this is what people fail to realize. I'm not the best beat maker. Mm-hmm. See, a lot of people on here on YouTube want you to make the most immaculate beats of all times yes i right? do every time you show up and it's like <laughs> have you never been but in a session bro, before <laughs> a lot of times these beats i make on youtube are the ones people pick because that's those immaculate beats are good for beat battles mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they're good for the beat battles the big drops the breaks and this that whatever and, right. and all the cliche stuff that everybody hears oh you got to put the shaper box on this you got to put this on there we got to we, we got to Add this texture to it. We gotta do this and do that. I'll Ain't nobody trying to rap over that. Ain't nobody from somebody who comes from a beat battling background. Like I didn't battle DBIC at the Red Bull Big Tone years ago. Like I come from that LA when it had all that is like when it had that super strong beat culture at one one era. Like I was in the midst of this. I was at Lamert Park. I was in this mm. and seeing it. And it's like, fam, like you had to do that to to fight for your life in these beat yeah. battles. Like you, you, you're not going to last, but that doesn't serve when it comes to records and have any ability to not just get out the artist's way, but find how to compliment every, every thing about that session. And a lot of people don't understand that, that um a lot of that stuff you can't teach. You got to learn it through experience. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they, they expect you to, to do that, but going back to it, like my guy yeah. basically broke that down to me. And what I did was I had my laptop. I was sitting in the bed after he gave me a, a, a reality check. Mm-hmm. I was sitting in the bed. I didn't have any sessions going on that day. I took my laptop and I made a video on how to import drums onto Logic Pro mm-hmm. the fast way. Because it, you know, it wasn't like how it was now, but I showed people how to do it using contact. Right. And I left it alone and I got some views on it. And I was like, okay, cool. That's, I, I kind of like that. And I made another video. Then I stopped for a while. Mm-hmm. Then I said, you know what? I'm off tour. I'm not doing anything no more. Let me just go ahead and just make some beats online. Let me just do a few things and just have some fun with this. Because I, right. I was at the house most of the day. Because I was making... I'm not going to tell you how much I made, but I was making... <laughs> Uh, by, Very this, good. by this it's, time, you you didn't already told us that that, that that in your independent stage you were generating enough income to last you from 2008 to 2012 through a recession. We know, we know. Like when I typed your name in for Google trying to find an interview, before I could even put the word interview, it said net worth. Well, somebody <laughs> typed that up. They want to know what that is first. So like we we super salute, and I and I think that all of us are inspired by it because you talk. So f- you, you talk very uh, transparent about how much of this you were doing on an independent level. And that inspires so many of us in here. Right. Especially me, because this is this is the mountain that I have told myself I am committed to not only doing for my own music, but for my YouTube channel, making content that is specifically for the independent artist and producer, because it's just coming up. There wasn't an ab- abundance of information, even the idea of when you call yourself independent. You know, I have to, like, make sure that when people say things like, you know, there's the major industry, like there's the big leagues and then there's like independent. And I'm like, that's the wrong way to look at it, because when you hear stories like you you shared today with the Salento record going from being the homie that's doing the graphic art, fixing the graphic art and then you uploading that to TuneCore and that thing already you said went gold before the labels got involved. Right. Like that's it went gold before you signed. Before yeah, you signed. It so it, it was involved the whole time, but it, it, it went gold. Before we even signed a deal. Yeah. So I say that to say like that was done in the air where even now the tools we have today weren't as readily available. Sky is really the limit for so many of us. If we choose to look at this and say, you know what? What they say? Uh, 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 burn the boats, take over the island. <laughs> right. You, so, yeah. Yeah. Listen, listen, at the end of the day, you got to look at it like this. Um, independent there is and, and you got to use is is you're not even independent anymore nobody is independent anymore what do you mean they got the record they did exactly what they wanted to do they got rid of all of the middlemen 
You remember the dude who used to sell the CDs mm-hmm. and all that stuff? There's no more of that no more. <laughs> He's not even selling DVDs something. no more. That's crazy. It's nothing because yeah. everything is through iTunes, Amazon, all that stuff now. So, mm-hmm. but guess what? People are like I'm independent. Ain't nobody gonna sign me to a 360 deal, mm-hmm. bro. Did you not see how much Apple takes out of your sale? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They take thirty cents. They take thirty percent of your sale off a price point they they created. At the alpha price point that they created. That's nuts. They take 30 cents. That's 30 cents. So we all signed to us. And, and, and you know what? That's where I'm super huge on ownership, right? I'm like, I'm, I'm big fan of, of Nipsey Hustle, the movement, his interviews and the things that he talked about, had the opportunity to meet the brother a few times um, before his untimely pass. And man, it was always something inspiring. Like I remember the first time I saw the hundred dollar or the thousand dollar album. And then I was like, I want to make a hundred dollar box. Right. Cause I don't think nobody gonna pay a thousand dollars for anything. I got, I'll make a hundred dollar box. And I remember uh respect magazine talked about it. He retweeted it and ownership became sort of like, yeah, that's what it is. We want ownership. We want to be completely independent and see what we can do. However, I think there's certain things that you got to learn firsthand when you try to do it for yourself, that some things are never going to be truly independent, right? When you're sharing these platforms, when you're sharing these 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 uh social media networks, somebody has more control over your business than you ever will. Cuz at any given point in time, think about all of the TikTokers who blow up on there and they're like, "Yeah, like I'm we're leveling the playing field." And it's like, "Fam, these networks won't even give you access to the email of the people who subscribe to you and who follow you." That's right. Like you, you, you said a mouthful. So think about it. iTunes. You, you. If you sell it for a dollar, you're only getting sixty nine cents. <laughs> if you sell it for a dollar twenty nine, you're only getting ninety nine cents. Mm. Okay. Now that's if you make a sale. That's not even, we're not even talking about streaming. streaming. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I tell people a lot of times, yeah, I I, I, I hear your little million streams. That's real right. cute. That's right. cool. That's cute. But I know what how much I made off of streams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a lot going, it's a lot going on. And I tell people a lot of times, yeah, that kid, case in point, there's a lot of producers right now who, are going, they're getting these platinum plaques. Mm-hmm. I produced for this person. I got a platinum plaque. I got this plaque. Right. But you're on there with four other producers. You're on there with four other producers. Mm-hmm. And you might have, there's some producers that got 16, 17 platinum records mm-hmm. and still have not made $400,000. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen producers who get some of the most prestigious awards that you can get as a music producer and um, are couch hopping. Right. Um, I, yeah. I, without even speaking on them, when I got my first placement after a year of having to go back and forth with the finance department to try to get them to actually spell my government name and not my artist name or my producer name on the check um, came to find out the office was literally down the street from my house and I was living in, in Rancho Cucamonga at the time. I had no idea the office was down there. I was just waiting on a check to come in, snail mail style. And it's so crazy to meet people who love the records that I produce for folks like Ab Soul. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, this person probably has more money in their pocket than I have to my name. And that's the part of it, Bolo, that, that really, really inspired me to, to, to jump here in this space and say, man, And I wonder how much of this is the same for you in that, yeah, you did have a lot of time, but then also, too, you have had experiences that 96 percent, 97, 98, maybe even 99 percent of music producers who are watching, who are not watching, will never experience. All the people that you have met, even the experience of when things all went wrong in a studio session, it still ends up being one of the biggest songs of all time within hip hop culture. Like there's so many things that have happened that for you have been normalized because you went through them that, that you, you, you know, you're, you're appreciative of them, but you're always thinking about the work. So many folks will never experience that. And the only way they will ever learn about it is through 
a 10 minute video from Bolo, 10 minute video from Curtis King about a subject. And I sometimes have to be reminded how valuable some of these public conversations are because I didn't have them coming up. You got to have them and they got to be honest. Yeah. Like I'm got to be honest. Got to be honest. I'm, I, I like to do things through laughter. I like to give my message through laughter. Even when I talk about certain products, I always try to keep it light. I don't really get into all of the specifics. Like I'm going to be totally honest with you. I think the whole YouTube producer hate thing is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. What do you mean because, when you say that? So, so, so like, people know like say for instance, if, 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 if a producer puts up a video, another producer is like, oh, I don't, I don't like what this person said or this person's wrong. And it's like it's like a pro producer beef type of situation, mm -hmm. whatever. <laughs> I think it's the craziest thing because a lot of the producers have never even been in the deep end of the music industry mm. to really know what that shallow field is. Right. Like, you don't know pressure until you get into the type of pressure I had. You don't know the type of depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. all that stuff I had. And I don't even know why I even had it. Man. Oof. It's so many people go through it. Every producer, once they make that real bad, mm -hmm. they all go through it because now you have a different pressure on you. Man. And so I fought it and still fight it to this day. Mm -hmm. And so for people to sit here and, you know, like the, the one thing people have to understand is these are people's opinions and this is their feelings on what they feel. Like if you feel right. this plug-in does not sound good, you you might have a valid reason because you feel that way. Right. I may say I like this plug in. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Yeah. Some people say like it's people come on my page. They're like, I don't see why you would produce with hardware. It takes so long. It does this. <laughs> it does that. But then the same people who say that will be on FL and be taking three hours to make a beat. And I've cruise through 10 right. beats in the hour on here. Right, right, right. It's 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 just everything is made up different. And when or, I see Or they won't even have anything on their page to begin with. I've noticed the people that bark the loudest, YouTube's be the quietest. Yeah. They're but, like like know, four or five videos and then they just they use that to just be disruptive. Yeah, but like even like, you know, we all know brother Abe McCree. <laughs> Abe is very opinionated, and I love Abe. Right, I right. like it. I like it. I like people to be opinionated. There's a lane I think for it. it. Yeah, there's a lane for it now. It's a lane for it. You know what I'm saying? Right. And some people might say, "Oh man, Abe is this, that, whatever." I said, "Okay, if you think he's bad, go ahead and go into some of these studio sessions and play your beats and have somebody go your face and tell you that shit sucks." Bolo, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. I when 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 you give them a harsh reality and it's like this is not harsh. This is what you're getting in a public forum, and it may hurt. It may sting a little bit differently because you've never been in a studio where five of five producers that you you look at, you look to their work. Like it's been situations where I look up to all the producers in the room, and they are one at a time, like just ragging on this beat like look at the sound <laughs> selection oh my who do you get these drums from like bro like you're dry. like you need that because it, it's character building and a lot of people never experience that until they meet someone online that cares enough to even give you that transparency but like bro you're not gonna grow that's how we grew it's being in environments where it's like you either get hurt and just never progress or you say all right cool i'm i'm, I'm gonna work on that and, and, and just to a point for the producers that are on here, if you ever go through that type of situation where you feel like, dang, I just messed up my one and only chance, you didn't. No. Because the main ones who are talking, uh, what you could do in that situation, if somebody says, hey, man, your beats just saying it, your beats just saying that, what you do is you put them to the side and be like, hey, listen, I need to, I need to figure this out from mm -hmm, you then. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times... Those people are saying those things in there because there are probably other egos in there. So somebody has to be the alpha dog. Right. Sometimes you got to stroke the egos of certain people to get to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if somebody's telling you that and they're giving you that criticism, a lot of times they just want to talk. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you might be the understudy who they just might feel like, hey, 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 man, I, I don't, hey, bro, can I intern for you? Mm -hmm. Can I do something? Mm -hmm. I just need to learn from you. 
I'll do whatever. If you need me here at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, I'll do whatever. If you need me, to, like, during your studio sessions, I can watch you cook up or I can set up your stuff or carry your stuff in or right. I could be your runner. Instead of the engineer leaving, I can go do you be a runner. It's little stuff like that. Huge. Would take it to a different point. That's what I did. Like, you got to think, I, I was a platinum producer engineering. Mm. And these people are talking to me like the engineer, like, hey, bro, run that shit back. Hey, come on, what's going on, engineer? And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, bro, you're never going to be in my shoes. Right, right. But, hey, I got you, bro. Hey, but come here, let me show you this. And after a while, they be like, so, so you like, and then I start playing some beats. They're like, oh, she produced. I'm like, yeah, I produced this, this. They're like, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. See, even I, to this day, it's some yeah. people coming to my studio. Well, I come through and I check in on them, mm -hmm. and these guys walk through, damn near bump me on my shoulders and walk right past me because they don't know who I am. And I was like, all right, cool. I don't be like, I'm Bolo, I'm this, I'm that. Right. I don't never do that. But then there'll be the people like, oh, this is the owner of the studio. This is Bolo. They'll be like, oh, Bolo, like Bolo, like, yeah, it's me. Oh, great, that's crazy. Da, da, da. And then the energy changes. But see, Bolo, I, and this is me just being transparent with you because you've been so transparent through this. I think that was the most. That was one of the most challenging things for me when I was pursuing opportunities in the industry was like growing up, my pops was strict. My pops was hot headed and mm. I carried on a lot of that. Not to make an excuse in terms of like, that's how I am, because obviously I am who I am. But a lot of those situations were hard for me to, to, to eat that humble pie. And I did it. I did it so much that biting my tongue until like I, I just want to tear up because I'm like, fam, like. This is not even a situation of not having the clout in the room. This is a situation of respect man to man that I gave you the respect of least. You know what I'm saying? That Look, but this is not that's not the, that's not the dynamic. That's not how it worked. It took me years of being out of the industry to recognize, oh, this was the dynamic. And this is where I might have been in violation or whatever you want to call it. Now I sit back and I recognize, well, this is why God put me in this place to be who I am for the audience that I, I provide for. Um, but I love hearing this because it, 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 it does prepare the people who do have a desire to move into the industry to recognize you got to check your ego. You got to be able to hear the worst stuff about yourself. And on top of that, be grateful because a lot of people don't even care enough to tell you the truth about your own stuff, man. What they'll let you leave right on out of there. Like man, Booker hanging out your nose and all that. They don't care. People, people get mad at me sometimes with my beat reviews. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, uh, well, uh, you didn't really give me a uh, critique or or they'll say, well, you know, I feel like my beat wasn't that bad. Mm. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't the worst I heard. Mm -hmm. But this is just my opinion. And that's what you Out came and asked for. Billion people. You asked for my opinion. Not asked your my not my not your interpretation of my opinion. You asked for my opinion. My opinion. And this is <laughs> my opinion. My opinion is this. They're like, well, I I watch your YouTube channel. Your beats ain't really all that. They're not. Hmm. Because most people fail to realize I'm not a producer that engineers. I was an engineer, engineer that, that just so happened to know wow. how to produce. Yeah. So I don't care if you don't like my beats or not. Yeah. That you know what's, you know what's ironic? I feel that way in terms of I came in as a rapper and I only made beats because my homie bought MTV Music Generator. We we both went half on it, <laughs> right? We bought MTV Generator and he was like, "Man, we can make our own beats because at the time, like folks was just eating off they was just eating off the off the land, man. It was like yeah, 500 beats for a non-exclusive beat. Like $500 for a non-exclusive <laughs> And I'm like, we in high school. Where you getting $500 from somebody else in high oh, school? Yeah. But we didn't do it. So homie was like, all right, let's get this game. He spent one night with that game on PlayStation and was like, I ain't doing this shit. You take it home. And I was like, oh, okay, man. all right, well, I'll learn it. And that game changed the, the next 20 years of my life. And it ended up becoming eventually uh, my mom's rolling phantom that I kind of messed around a little bit. That's probably the only hardware I've ever got close to. Um, I had an MPC at one point in time, and I traded it in for some uh, some MX eight A M audio speakers that annoyed the, the oh the yeah shit. <laughs> they annoyed the hell out of my neighbors because it was so low end heavy. And then I went from there to FL Studio, and um, but I admire so many so many of y'all who who are like da fluid. So many of y'all that are that are um, 
seamlessly jump into the NPC because now I'm going backwards in that now I'm starting to want to get some more hardware. Like I was talking to the homie Stolen Drums and he was like, man, Kurt, I think you specifically need to get an SP uh, in 404. He's like, I think you specifically because of what you want to accomplish and the folks that you listen to, that'll be the move. But I want to segue this because, I, you know, I, obviously, I, man, I want to respect your time. And, bro, you you the audience in here seems over over appreciative of the gems you've been giving us, the transparency you've been giving us. We feel grateful to have you here, but I can't leave without, without shaking the room up a little bit, a little, 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 little controversy, if you don't mind, if you don't, if you don't mind, Not, nothing too crazy, nothing personal, nothing like that. But right. I have a question and, and it's, it's not a gripe with you, but it's, it's a question that I've always wanted to ask somebody who took the stance that you did on loop makers, collaborating with one another to, to create a loop, I know you had a very specific situation and I'm not even going to try to tear into that unless you want to share that with the audience in which multiple loop creators came together, collaborated. And when it was time to get this record out and, and, and cut the checks, somebody started getting a little bit, a little bit greedy about, about, about the, the, what they were owed. And it kind of put a wrench in things. I, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I have a question yeah. just about in general, um, an interesting dynamic that I've noticed. Listen, <laughs> he like is laid over here, Curtis. What you asking me right now? No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to say this as nicely as possible. Right. If you are a loop maker, that does not mean that you're the god over the track. Mm. Especially if you're sending me the loop. Mm -hmm. What people fail to realize is I don't need your loop mm -hmm. because to this day, I'm going to be totally honest with you. To this day, I've only gotten one song on an artist that did have somebody else's loop on it mm -hmm. with several loop makers because I've had other opportunities, but I, I would scratch a record before I deal with that. Mm hmm. So what this is what I love. Now, some of the people's loops, I love, love them. But I, I, I shy away from them because these kids are not understanding the business and they're losing out. Mm. A lot of these kids are losing out on a lot of stuff. But this is the thing. If it's like on an NBA young boy, I'm they're like, oh, just take it. I'll sign whatever paperwork right. you give me. But if it's somebody else who's smaller, it's like, oh, I need 10 grand. I need... Oh, and, wow. and, and a lot of times with that situation, I say, cool. Understanding you're looking at the opportunity about it like that, but every album like that is not going to go through the roof. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, especially if you're sending me a loop, that's cool. I don't need it mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we can just cancel Christmas on everything <laughs> and I can just use <laughs> Splice or something. Cancel Christmas is a crazy way to put it. I love it. I love it. So because. Well, People ahead. talk about Splice. Yeah. Oh, man. What if somebody else uses this loop? Or what if somebody else uses this loop or whatever? They will figure it out. Right. Right. It will get figured out. Y'all are worried about, a lot of these people be worried about stuff that hasn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard somebody with the same Splice loop. Yeah. And I've heard Marvin Gaye be sampled a thousand times. Right, right, right. It will get figured out. If it gets picked up by a label, it's going to get figured, figured out. out. Well, can I play devil's advocate on something? Just, just and I agree. Yeah. I agree with everything you're saying. There's nothing that I'm listening to when I'm like, um, I'm, I don't know about this. I'm in 100 percent agreement with you on the politics of that need to be ironed out. Folks don't need to be greedy. They need to understand, first of all, who's the quarterback of this situation and who whose network you're leveraging, whose name and reputation you're leveraging. And if you're a sample maker that is trying to make a name for yourself, you if you're in the industry, you're going to have to take situations where you feel like, well, I should get more. This is not that play. And sometimes one play will set you up for another major play. Mm -hmm. I think of my boy Nobby, my, not, uh, my boy Nobby, and we talk all the time about opportunities he has. And because he plays his cards right, like he's been on Drake albums, he's been, uh, you know, on Nas and 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 uh, Kanye albums, and it's like he has played it so smooth, and not once have you heard him ranting on Twitter about man, it's, he just does his job, shows up, and does his thing. 
But I, I want to play devil's advocate on this topic, and I want to get your point of view because nobody, I haven't shared this with anybody, but I saw a NAV clip where he was talking about something really similar, and he was saying, like, you know, these sample makers that have, or these producers in general who have all these different people who are having a hand in things, and it's just messing up the game and messing up the bread. But then I, I, when I thought about that, I listened to it, I understood it, but then I thought about the whole classic argument of beat maker versus producer. And... You did something, Bolo, first of all, that I think is it needs to be applauded, especially by us independents, because for somebody with as many placements as you, you have, as somebody who is as important to the industry as you are, you said something that none of your peers, at least I didn't hear any of your peers willing to say. You said, you know what? I apologize, producer community. Y'all are not just beat makers, right? You're producers, but of producers of beats. And then there's producers of songs, a.k.a. record producers. I started thinking about that dynamic, and then this is what I thought about with the sample makers. Could it be a possibility that these sample makers are creating their team of musicians for hire, of drummers, of all these people, and in their own way, their misguided way, imitating what they thought made someone a real producer, somebody like a Khaled who was able to orchestrate all these different moves and could it be that they're imitating that without direction and then you got certain people who don't go according to the plan and they're kind of going off script and saying well i think i should get 70 percent i wonder how much of that is them saying okay we hear you your definition of a real record producer i sometimes in these rooms i know i that was me i wasn't allowed to be anything beyond what a beat maker quote unquote beat maker was like TDE, I love I love my brothers over at TDE, but when I went in there, somebody already made more decisions about my beat than I could because I just didn't have the clout, I didn't have the the say so, I didn't have the, the the record to show that my production was valuable. Some people are not given the opportunity, so I wonder with the sample makers who are not getting a foot in the room if they're looking at this as the next best thing of them mimicking the role of the executive producer or the record producer in their own way. I just want to bring that up because it was something that crossed my mind. But I was like, I didn't I haven't shared it yet because I was like, I don't know if it hasn't been thought through enough. But I want to hear your POV on that, man. The end of the day is is too much inf information out. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is you have a lot of bad information out. And the thing about it is people are getting most of their information from the Internet. Mm hmm. And what I tell people all the time is when I was learning, when I learned anything from the Internet, I go look up several sources and I see what is consistent in what they're saying. Facts. Rather than somebody saying, hey, man, you this, you know, don't do if, if these artists do this to you. You ain't supposed to do this. You're supposed to go to independent route. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. And with all, a lot of these sample makers, whatever, they go by the first thing that they see that they agree with. Mm, that's the big the key. problem. Mm -hmm. The problem with people mm -hmm. is you want to just listen to the stuff that you agree with rather than the stuff that might hurt you a little bit. But it's right. It's good for you. Mm -hmm. Put what point blank. There was records that I wrote for Silento that I only got 5%. Wow. 8%. Right. 12%. 15%. Never had an issue with it because that's what they allocated. Mm -hmm. We only have 20% of this record left. I can't fight with it. But let me try to negotiate. At least give us an upfront fee, artist fee, let's do this, whatever like right. that. Because I know the power of percentages. Mm -hmm. I know how much I made off of record that I got 8% from that made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't have to put no marketing dollars into it. All I had to do was give them my, my pen game. Mm. So I know this. But a lot of people try. It, it's, it's a selfishness because everybody tries to go for the gusto every single day time yeah yeah yeah. curtis you know i know yeah <laughs> once you once once you once you okay like like youtube yeah you know your youtube stats you know your numbers mm -hmm. you know if i put this amount of videos out this week i know ballpark 
what I can make by the end of the month. Facts. If I, I know if I want to be lazy a little bit if I just feel like I just want to take a break from it mm -hmm. or whatever but I know what I need to do to do this and if I want to kick this into overdrive I can do it but what is what are you sacrificing at that point mm -hmm. you're sacrificing your time because these like even just this interview getting the camera set up getting the mic and everything right, right. getting all this stuff that takes time before you even get started yeah yeah, that's the pre. And then not, and then and then and then having to go actually do a real YouTube video and edit it and line up the audio and do this <laughs> and do that, like in in yeah. in our niche, we're one of the smallest niche niches where we don't, we don't get paid as much like that, mm -hmm. but we do most of the work. We sure do, and and we do a lot more work than a lot of other niches on YouTube, uh. but. That's what I'm saying. You know what you can do. Right. Same way with you doing these songs. I know what. 5%, 10%, 15, 20%, this, yeah. that, whatever. I know what it gets me. And that's what people fail to realize. They just look at the first person, like, yeah, man, you know, this your music. That's what you're supposed to do, man. You, you don't give nothing unless they give you what you want. Yeah. Bro, I didn't ask you for this loop. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I don't care if you're a producer. I don't care if you're a beat maker. I don't care if you're whatever. All I want to know is how much, if you say, Put it like this: If you say you really are down in this music game, mm -hmm. and this is what I don't understand, if you're just so much into this music, mm -hmm. and you just really live, eat, and breathe music, how in the hell can you not tell me how you get paid? Man, man, you don't have a clue about. You just hear about SoundCloud, but you don't know what it collects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't even yeah. know, like a lot of these people don't even know the Harry Fox agency. A lot of these people don't know about the 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 uh, the MLC. Mm -hmm. They don't know about these mm -hmm. things. But you say that you you want to get into this music business. You know so much about this, and this is what you do. But nobody, when's the last time you even heard anybody mention the Harry Fox agency or the MLC? You don't ever hear that. You never hear it mentioned. You don't. Yeah. Because they don't know. You get all these gurus who say they know about the music business and all this. Even half of the ARs don't even know how you get paid. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because the, they the, get a contract. They get a check the from the label. They get paid a, a set check. Yeah. Bola, I was surprised. Like that was one thing that that really blew me away. Of all the surprises that I got in the industry, all the A and R's that I met. I shouldn't say all because I still got some relationships, <laughs> but many of them that I met, I couldn't help but ask in my head. So what do you do? Like what exact? Because because I'm because, you know, they would come in and I'm like. I had one one time and I'm not going to name names, but he came in on behalf of Schoolboy Q and he wanted beats for Schoolboy Q and he was like. Yeah, I, th I think what he really wants is something like this and something like this. And I'm like, I know Schoolboy Q. I didn't cook up for Schoolboy Q in the studio at TDE Studio. I spent the night at the studio. Like, I didn't cook up for him. Was on the same thing that I leave. I, I know, like, and he's telling me, yeah, I don't think he would like something like that. I think he wants something like more like hands on the wheel. I'm like, does he want that or do you want that as somebody representing the financial interests of the record? And it's like, to me, that was a part of it that. You know, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll be transparent, Bolo, like there are things that you're mentioning that I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to do my homework. I got to get my homework up on some of this stuff. But I think for the longest time, my pro independence was it was poisoned by my anti industry because of the things that happened to me. And that and look, and I, I remember that. Yeah, I watched that and I wasn't mad at it. Because I was the same way. Some people were. Why? Why did you take another direction? Because I had, man, I've had people call me. I've had some real conversations over the last few weeks uh, with the homie Willie B. He he really had a really good heart to heart, and I was like, bro, you're one of the only people that I considered a friend in here that was willing to even be this transparent about. Look, bro, I love you. I know you mean well. I know you're a good guy, but it's hard to stand by that because it compromises my relationships, especially when it comes to financial. But why were you at, able at to kind of see day, it from a different POV? At the end of the day, <laughs> you gotta understand this. Record companies, record labels, people are corporations. Mm -hmm. If they can make money from it, 
It doesn't matter what the hell you do. Mm. It doesn't matter what the hell you say. People run around here scared like I can't say this or I can't say that. You can. Because if I come with another hit record, they're going to be right back. Bolo, right. what's good, baby? Right. <laughs> baby. <laughs> what's good? It's so true. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But in the meantime, I'm cooling. I'm chilling. Yeah. Because I because I got to a point now where like I can live my life without the industry. Mm, that's huge. And, 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 and Bola, I, you know, I like I said, I want to respect your time and I want to kind of bring it here to a close. But yeah. one thing I had to absolutely ask you about is you said um, you mentioned your age earlier. You were saying that, that you, you had uh, turned 41 this year. I'm turning 43 in 43. February. February okay, 43. OK. February 8th, you guys. So, you know, Cash App, it needs hey, to be jumping. Look, if I need to put that on a live stream when I'm on here, man, all I got to do is <laughs> get a reminder. I'm on it, man. We got to for sure turn up for you. But um, 43, I'm watching you navigate social media in such an organic way. I'm not seeing you like if anybody can get on TikTok right now and do a dance, it's the person that made the Salento song. Now watch me, Nate. If anybody is excused and anybody going to judge nothing about age, it is you. But the fact that you have pivoted and said, here's what my greatest sense of humor is and here's what I'm going to do. It's so inspiring to so many folks who feel like social media is like they missed that boat. Like they feel like that's not for their age group because they think about folks who are closer to their age. Like I have friends who are closer to my age, 38, uh, you know, 38, 39, who are like, yo, you still doing this music thing? Like you still on social media, bro? You trying to be an influencer? And it's like they're, they're not understanding what you're actually doing. But I'm watching you, Bola. Like I just figured it's, out I wasn't following you, but you were on my timeline so damn much going viral. <laughs> How are you because, able to tap into that and, and find your own voice in such a young, dominated space? Because there's a whole bunch of old people like me, quote unquote old, that can't even run two miles. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, there's a lot of young people that cannot even lift the, the amount of weights I can lift. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people think I'm short. For some reason, they meet me. They're like, "Dang, I, thought I you never were thought short. that." Especially with all that sports talk you're talking about, I'm like, "Nah, anybody sports, sp anybody short that's getting all these, all of these uh opportunities <laughs> to play sports." So yeah, for like, sure. I don't know what they, 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 People think I'm short and fat for some reason. They see me, they're like, "Yo, bro, you like you kind of built, you tall as hell." I'm like, "Yeah,", yeah. you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> I'm I'm in shape. Right, you know what I'm right. saying? I still I, I pull a few pounds on, but I'm in shape, and I feel good about life, and I don't let let other people determine what my vision is. Mm. All I'm doing on Instagram, if you think about it, all I'm doing with some of those videos that went viral are nothing but scenarios that I went through in the studio. <laughs> You're just telling your truth. You're telling your truth in your own way and it's translating. Yeah. Now, some of the stuff is over-exaggerated, but right. it's it's a lot of that stuff has happened. You haven't even seen some other ones I've done, but a lot of that stuff it is, is true stuff like when people would come in and ask stupid questions or a singer go in there or rappers do certain things in the booth that just don't make no sense or you know and then i now i'm starting to just repost some stuff that i think is just funny i just post stuff to think to make people laugh yeah that's it yeah yeah you you because it's already enough stuff it's already enough drama and everything else sometimes people want to scroll through the drama then they want to go ahead and break that drama by a quick laugh. And then they want to go back to scroll to the drama again. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. But I'm just doing what makes me laugh. All of my reels I laugh at because I think they're funny. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's just how it is. So like, it, for, for, like I tell everybody, I did not get my first big hit until I was 30. I made that beat when I was 34 years old. Mm. 34. No, no, 34, 35. One of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But 35, whatever. I didn't get my first big, huge placement until I was 35. Yeah. The record labels were like, oh, we can't use that one. The producer's 35 years old. That's what if they were saying? Like that you... style, would... That's what they were saying? No, nah, no, they were never saying they were that. Never but they're okay. not going to say that. Right, they're right. They're not going to because they, they, because people fail to realize is labels don't care about artists; they care about these songs. Mm. 
you could be the finest artist in the world and have a dud song, or you could be the ugliest artist in the world and have a hit record, and they're going to push you to the cat, push you to the moon. Right, right. So it's, you, you just got to keep working. It doesn't matter. Gunnam style, he's like 60 when he came out. It doesn't still matter. Still running that song up. Oh, he's still. Like, I just watched a video. It had to be at least 60,000, 70,000 people going crazy to this song that came out. I don't know how long. Um, th there's a. Have you ever saw this documentary called uh, Search for Sugar Man? No, I haven't Yo, seen that. Yo, Bolo, check that out. That that I saw that when I started getting really insecure about what my career would mean now that I pivoted to YouTube and uh, so many of the relationships I had in the industry weren't necessarily the same as they were. I was like, people are going to write me off for doing this. And I watched this movie called Search for Sugar Man. And not to give it away, but um, he made that song, Sugar Man. Sugar. Okay, I know you're coming. Yeah. We all have heard the song, never really heard his story. And um, I mean, I'm going to kind of give it away a little bit, but you still, you still should watch it in that this man didn't realize that when that song got released, like they were trying to push him, I think, as the next Bob Dylan, and it just didn't get off. Like this, the, the record yeah. just just trashed. And then someone took the record over to Africa during uh during like like some 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 unrest and like some some uh some 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 fighting going back and forth, and it became the soundtrack of that time for those that were that were fighting. And years and years later, he doesn't realize a man is like. He's working a nine to five job, blue collar, I believe, in Detroit. He didn't realize <laughs> until these docu documentarians find him, he is a living legend out there. They fly him out. <laughs> he's looking up from the limo and looking up at the streets. They got pictures of him when he's younger. He, <laughs> he goes to a stadium in Africa, sold out. He hadn't performed since the song came out in like, I want to say like, it might have been a 60s, 70s. And... And it just it, it blew him away to the point where he didn't realize he had such a massive audience for what he did because he just the Internet wasn't was what it is today. And it just shows you like it is never too late, especially when it that. comes to finding you, you got to search for Sugar Man. It's an older documentary, but it's so potent in that we all have our tribe. It's just up to us to stick around, first of all continue to evolve and continue to put the content out there because you never know who's been waiting for that and looking for you or who already knows and didn't know how to stay connected with you. So man, never know. such a great, and, you know, and I know I got to get off in a second. For too, sure. but I, I do want to say this too. So everybody's watching. There is nothing wrong with you doing music and you having a job. Yes. Okay. Talk about that. Nothing wrong with it. Cause even though some people are like, well, I'm a YouTuber, that's a job. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm a, I'm a producer. That's a job. Mm -hmm. everything we do is a job and some days we, we want to show up to our jobs some days we don't feel good whatever it's a job but it's nothing wrong with having a nine to five doing this music thing because you have to have some type of stability because at the end of the day if you are working eight nine hours out the day you still have four or five hours that you can still do your music and still do whatever if you really want to do it and i to be honest i never really had a job mm -hmm. i worked at walmart for about a year <laughs> it was like some other stuff but that was in college, okay. but which, but I had to struggle a lot of years because I, I I did not have a job. I struggled, yeah, in college and to certain points, and I made it look good, but I was really going through it. But I, but this was something that took over my pain in a sense. Mm. So there's nothing wrong with having a job. There's nothing wrong with with d d d living a family life. There's nothing wrong with living a good life. Mm -hmm. living a righteous life you know i'm not saying everybody has to be the the the, the, the best uh, you know whatever you your religion is you don't have to be like the super man of that but just just do right by people yeah be somebody who people can approach and 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 be able to ask questions and do things even if you get to that point and i guarantee you like your life will be so much better because yeah. your beats come out better the way you think comes out better, everything comes out better when you're living a life to where you know you're true to yourself and you're not trying to F over anybody, mm -hmm. not trying to do whatever, and you be honest with people. Yeah. You be honest with people, and they might not like it, but you got to be honest. And and the main thing is to be honest with yourself. Hey, man, yeah. Well, you well, do that, yeah. everything is cool. 
Bola, I, I, man, thank you first and foremost for your time. Thank you so much for being so candid about the conversation. Personally, man, I, I, it's individuals like yourself that that give me a lot of encouragement because you got to understand me and you, you probably already do understand me being in an L.A. scene. I've seen the biggest of egos. I've seen the humblest of individuals. I've seen folks that remind me of the energy that you have. But you continuing to be successful, you continuing to be hungry, you t- continuing to do the things that have set you up to be as successful as you are. That inspires me into not looking at what my peers may say, like, oh, this must be the last season. It's like I don't feel like it's the last season because I don't surround myself by people who, you know, will, will, will guilt me for things like if I needed to go pick up a job. Like, because I tell you this, after the pandemic, they got they got a situation where my 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 business it was thriving during the pandemic. The year after. It just went down the shoot and a lot of things happened. I was like, yo, am I going to have to go get a job and not even going to have to? I need to do that because I have a son. I've had a, I've had a four year old. I got my wife. We had a new home that we were we were renting. And so it was like, if I got to do it, I got to do it. No shame. But even more so now, I, I love that you make that the last message that you end on because it just shows your heart. It shows your dedication to it. And I think sometimes the most. It may sound backwards, but the most beautiful gesture that you can give to this thing that you call music that you say use their love and your passion is to take care of the security that makes you not have to stress about how to get that passion yeah. heard, how to buy the equipment to make the music that you want to make. And I think so many people look at their jobs as an enemy of their time because it does take up a lot of time. But I'm like, had I had to do it all over again, like when I worked at Quiznos, I worked at Quiznos, that was my job. I worked at Quiznos. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have looked at it as my angel investor. Right. I may not agree with some of the decisions that they make about my time, but this angel investor is the reason why I was able to buy my first surround sound speakers for my studio. Right. Where I was able to upgrade my my computer. It just doesn't happen without that. So for those of you holding it down a nine to five, I, I have to encourage you the same way Bolo did. And that not only should you embrace it, but that's a part of your story. And if anything good comes out of your career that you're proud of, to a certain degree, you got to give credit to whatever bad that that job brought and whatever good it brought, because it's part of the process, it's part of the story. Bolo, you, you, you one of a kind, man, and I, I hope to build with you even more as time goes on. But man, this has been a superb conversation. Uh, thank you for your time that you could could have been with your family, man. We love you, and we we uh, a thousand percent support you. Last thing I'll say is you you one of them guys that make it really really hard for me to ever ever be. In that space I was where I was getting in my anti-industry because folks like you exist and we want to see you win. Continue Man, I to appreciate win. the opportunity. I appreciate everybody staying on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And hey, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Curtis for hitting me up, man. And 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 you know, I was actually kind of a little bit like that. Nah, <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm like it that, dawned you know on me. It dawned on me because I seen like like even like like me and Bricks got to have a conversation at some point. But I know he might have felt a certain way towards me when you know I was doing my skits and all of that. He he hit me up and told me. But I know that's your yeah, folks, that's, and I'm yeah, like, yeah, that's just Bricks. Bricks I, is all right. Yeah. I know that's your folks. I, I out of respect for everybody that 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 stands by you and supports you, like I'm going through a transformation in which I'm having to hold myself accountable. You said it earlier. You got to be able to hold yourself accountable and realize you're responsible for everything that happens to you. Even I don't have a desire to do anything within the industry. I have so many folks that I got love for that I want to see win. And if the industry ever decides we don't want you, I'm trying to do whatever I can to build something out here that creates more jobs and more opportunities for those people who have forgotten. You've been here so long, y'all forgotten more than some people even know. So. That's what I feel like my yeah. my my space is out here. And man, like I said, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time, bro. Man, no problem, man. And we'll get up again. Okay. I appreciate everybody. I appreciate y'all for hanging on. Thank you so much for having me on your platform. And man, just I just appreciate everybody just for hanging around this whole interview. Man, likewise. Okay, we talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh yeah. I will see you tomorrow for the Flocation Cook Up. Much love to you. Definitely go follow. Where can they follow you at really quick? Just really quick so they can get the, that information. Everything is Bolo, the producer, B-O-L-O-D-A producer. And that's on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. But it's mostly on Instagram, Bolo, the producer.
Here it is. All right, y'all have a good night. Peace.